All right. We're going to call the meeting to order, the select board meeting to order. I'm joined by my colleagues, Mr. O'Leary, Mr. Walner, Mr. Studo, and Mrs. Gonzalez. And we'll begin with the recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America and to the and republic, republic for which it stands, stands one nation, nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. Uh, to my colleagues, I know we have a busy agenda, but I'd like to open just with a brief moment of silence for our longtime resident and fixture in our community, uh, longtime servant to our community and to members of our community, Gloria Maestro, who passed away. If you'd all join me just for a brief moment of silence, and then I'll give my colleagues the opportunity to, to to comment on how they how they came to know Mrs. My, Ms. Maestro. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if any of my colleagues would like to give some remarks, um, how about we start off with you, Mr. O'Leary? Uh, I probably only know Gloria about. 55 years. <laughs> um, you get to go first because you probably have known her the longest. Oh my goodness, I tell you, you know, what a, uh, what a dynamic individual and contributing member of this uh, community uh, Gloria has been. And it's, I'm saddened to, uh, and I heard that she wasn't doing well uh, last week or two. <clears throat> uh, but, you know, Gloria served in a lot of voluntary capacities for uh, a lot of organizations in the community, um, youth service organizations, um, senior citizen organizations. She was on the Council on Aging, was uh, Friends of the Council on Aging, uh, Historical and Antiquarian Society. She's a member of the Board of Registrars. And I can go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, one thing about Gloria was, uh, I don't think the, the woman ever slept. So you may she rest in peace, truly. <laughs> uh, she was uh, nonstop, 24 seven, always doing something for somebody else. and. Uh, she was a dear friend of my mother, and you know, the two of them, when they got together, it was not a good, not a good thing. You know, they solved all the world's problems together, and you know, Gloria would sometimes show up at my mother's house at ten o'clock at night, ten thirty, and they'd talk the the night away till two o'clock in the morning until they both fell asleep in the chair. You know, and then all of a sudden, Gloria would get up at two thirty in the morning and go out and do something else. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, sounds fun. And raised, a, you know, <laughs> raised a, a, a large family. Yeah. Uh, all of them again, good members of the community, and. Some of them still business people here, um, but, but again, I love Gloria. Uh, she was never shy about uh, expressing her thoughts and beliefs and things. Um, she had my cell phone. She used it often, and I, and I enjoyed the calls. I enjoyed the conversation, and I enjoyed uh, Gloria being a, a part of my life and my family's life, but also uh, part of the community. So she's going to be sorely missed. Thanks, Mr. O'Leary. Anyone else want to share some comments? I would love to. Mrs. Gonzalez. Yeah. So um, Gloria and I go back to when my, my kids were young and I would help Kathy Lee run the vacation Bible school at St. Teresa's. And she would come in, it was for a week every summer and she would be there bright and early, ready to work, uh, usually right into the kitchen. She loved to get the snacks ready for the kids at snack time um, and just do whatever we wanted her to do or needed her to do. And she loved being there. And at the end of every week, she would have a gift, a special little gift for each person that was <laughs> working the Bible school. And um, she would have a reason for each gift, why she picked it out specifically for each person. She was just so thoughtful. Um, and we stayed friends over the years. And when I got on the board, she gave me a list of things that she thought should be done that hadn't been done yet. And, <laughs> and she would, she actually just sent me a letter in the mail. I got in April, um, just catching up with me and articles that she had um, cut out, you know, of my daughter or whatever that, you know, she thought would interest in me and something that she thought would be a good Christmas present for my husband. And then told me that I hadn't, she hadn't seen anything on her honey-do list done yet <laughs> and was reminding me. 
So um, she was just a character. She was a one of a kind. And I, I loved talking to her. She was a, a wealth of knowledge and just, um, just a, a lovely lady. And uh, she will be missed. She will be missed by the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Mr. Walner. Um, I, I'll echo what I've just heard from both of them. I've known Gloria for about eight years. Um, she quickly joined the, um, uh, the SSAT group, which is part of the CIT, the uh, Social Services Action Team. And she quickly gave me many lessons about how I'm not handling <laughs> very well. <laughs> and she would have articles and she would tell me pretty straight out, you know, you're not doing this right. You got to be doing more of this. And it was always, you know, it was always understood that it was with great intentions on her part. And, you know, she, even at the Apple Fest, I remember sitting in her little bonnet or whatever you want to call it, you know, very proud of working with the, uh, the that group there. So just a very positive person and really up until the last minute here, she's been trying to get the, uh, she's been talking to me about this and just organizing at the Boston and Kane Award, um, which is something that you'll still probably hear about the organizing meeting up until just very recently. So um, yeah, Gloria will be missed and uh, I've always appreciated her uh, her just willing to say what was on her mind and uh, and to show up and she showed up which was okay. you know, she showed up for many things when it was hard for her to move around and I gave her a lot of credit for that as well so um, and she's a neighbor as well so I'll, I'll miss her for a number of reasons different reasons so thanks, thanks for having yeah by the way I, I, I sicked her on you on that Boston Kane issue she called me <laughs> and I said oh I'm not the liaison anymore you, you have Rich's number I have his number Okay, good. I got on the list. <laughs> Please, uh, Ms. Castrudo, since you joined us when we were pretty much virtual, I don't even know if you had the opportunity to interact with her, but... I, I did not, yeah. which it sounds like... Uh, you would right have, my I alley. think. Right. It sounds like yeah. she's, yeah, kind of how I operate, so it's too bad. And uh, that is the one downfall of all this is that you uh you miss out on meeting very interesting people sure. and you find out after the fact when it's too late so that's uh it's unfortunate but it seems to be reoccurring and it seems like she was someone who uh, definitely definitely could have gave me a big rundown on the town yes. oh, yeah. it seems like whether i liked it or not so that would have been nice <laughs> Right. Well, I, de I definitely came to know her from my service to the town on the select board. But prior <laughs> to that, would read a, of her attending or see her in pictures and attending events because she did go to a lot of things like Mr. Walner said. And definitely I would not characterize her as shy about telling us what she wanted us to do and how to do it. However, not in an offensive uh, manner, just a very, always with a smile on her face, pleasant. This is what would be good for the town type of a person. So she will definitely be missed. And we want to share our condolences with her family and let her family know that we're thinking of them and that they're in our thoughts and prayers. Um, and I don't know, Mr. Gilberto, if you want to bring up the conclusion of these comments, but I'm sure you knew her quite well too. Yes, um, Gloria would um, regularly visit the town hall, sometimes on her way into uh, her SSAT meetings in room 14, uh, but she would come in for other purposes as well and clearly was um, very dedicated to pushing forward causes that were important to her even when her physical limitations made it difficult to do so. Um, but probably most importantly for the Gilberto home is she uh, was a server of cookies um, the Sunday afternoon of the uh, Christmas tree lighting over on the common and uh, my kids a couple of times had the opportunity to interact with her in the Putnam house for that so uh, I appreciate that I'll always remember that at my house thank you madam chair thank you to my colleagues um, all right so our next order of business is minutes I a member has asked that we pass over this because uh, there are some uh, requested modifications to those so We'll move on to the COVID-19 update and back to you, Mr. Gilberto, on that. Madam, Madam Chair, if I could, um, I did talk to Mr. Gilberto earlier, so I, oh, sure. this is I don't know if he had already adjusted those. Madam Chair, through you and uh, Madam Vice Chair, so I, uh, it wasn't until about seven o'clock on the nose, but I, I did upload revised uh, version and for the board members, the uh, 
the, the changes were, um, Mr. Studo was referred to a number of times as Mr. Vincenzo. Uh, <laughs> so we've um, used the, the function of um, find and replace to correct that. And then similarly, uh, Mrs. Gonzalez was identified as Mrs. Gonzalves uh, again. Um, I know that that happened in a previous meeting. Um, but I'm not sure why that um, carries forward, but it did. Um, but we did correct that as well. So if you look in the meeting folder, um, there were four, there are now five items. One of them is a marked up version of the minutes with those corrections in it. Um, I believe I caught all of them, um, but um, if I've missed one, certainly anyone can correct me. But Mrs. Gonzalez, that was the extent of your concerns, correct? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking at them now. They're all corrected. Although uh, I do have a lot of random clients who call me Mr. Vincenzo, so it wouldn't have been really that big of a deal here, so. I, I I think if, if you are at Mrs. Gonzalez, have you had the chance to look at the updated ones? Um, no, I or, didn't. Okay, so should we, we'll hold on to that till the next meeting until we make sure all those changes are, I haven't looked at them either, but okay. um, why don't we just wait until you've had the opportunity and we'll, we can um, consider those for approval at the next meeting. Um, and now, okay, so Mr. I, I also just wanted to note to the board, I didn't see this until now, but John Maestro said to thank everyone. I should have, you know, should have let him speak too, but I'm sorry uh, for not doing that, so. I believe Ann is here, Ann Valade. I oh. am. Yes. Oh, I should have. Gloria's daughter. That's all right, we just, I just wanna say thank you too for taking time from your meeting to recognize her. As you know, civic duty was very important to her, so she would have been honored to have you speak on her behalf. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah nobody ever spoke on your mother's behalf. <laughs> well, this is true, Steve, you're right. <laughs> yeah. Definitely a special lady, so these people are gems to our community, yes. so it's important. Thank you. Definitely important to recognize them. Thank okay. you. Thank you for sharing her with us. Thank you. Thank All you. Right. Now, Mr. Gilberto, COVID-19. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my, my update uh, this evening is uh, limited. Um, I will just note that uh, as we reported on January 6th, uh, we were um, at 700 cases of COVID-19 since the pandemic began here um, in North Reading. 634 residents and 66 patients at or associated with Royal Meadowview Nursing and Rehabilitation Center. Um, at that time, uh, January 6th, the health department was monitoring 151 cases, um, 16 cases, including 13 at or associated Royal Meadowview, and two residents and one suspected case in a town resident uh, were deceased or have been deceased. Have deceased. Um, I will note also that at that time, I think the number was the health department had assisted with the schools in um, responding to 23 staff and 64 student cases of COVID-19 in the public schools. Um, we've also been working in conjunction with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to investigate a cluster of cases um, at, associated with Reading Gymnastics. Um, not all of those cases are here in North Reading. There are, of course, a number from throughout the region. Uh, and so we've been working with them for the past couple of weeks um, to resolve that um, that, that any uh, outstanding issues associated with that. Um, I will say that, you know, in a, you know, with regard to the data, the overall case numbers continue to increase in the community, uh, but there does continue to be confidence that the public schools are not a significant source of transmission of the virus at this point in time. And uh, as at that moment, last week, there were no plans to alter the current hybrid school operation schedule. <clears throat> Excuse me. One um, final thing that I will note is, um, I think a sign of um, certainly of hope, which is that beginning tomorrow, um, we will be conducting a first responder vaccination clinic for uh, police officers and firefighters here in North Reading. Um, I want to recognize the planning effort on the part of the public safety director, Chief Murphy, the fire chief, Don Stats, the director of public health, Bob Bracey, and the public health nurse, Pam Vath, in particular, for working together to stand up this clinic um, in fairly short order and with um, certainly evolving guidelines 
Um, we have employees who have volunteered to assist with this, including the Board of Health Administrative Assistant um, and uh, Ms. Luckowitz is actually here uh, this, this evening and uh, will be helping as well. So um, we're, we're very much standing up uh, our own clinic that we will run for our personnel here in North Reading um, out of a town facility over the course of the next few days. And we're really um, pleased to be able to do that and to make that available to our, um, to our first responders. Um, and I believe that that concludes my comments relative to COVID-19. Great, thank you, Mr. Gilberto. Oh, um, Madam Chair, I know there was a previous question too at the last meeting. I, I apologize, but uh, regarding the tracking of the uh, cases um, and, and how the cases were, were, um, were classified. So the, the question was when there's an antigen test that tests positive, where does that kind of end up in? Mm -hmm. And so those numbers, um, they, they are reported in the monitoring cases. So that 151 that I just mentioned we were monitoring, any number of those could be antigen cases. If an antigen case becomes a negative, it is not reported and recorded into that grand total of 700. So I, I know there was a question about that. I did want to make sure I got back to the board on that issue. Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. Uh, any questions for Mr. Gilberto on his update? Uh, Madam Chair, just in, the, in relation to, you know, how are we forecasting um, what role we're going to be asked to play moving forward? I mean, it would appear as though there's a an aggressive uh, idea of trying to move these vaccines out more quickly, which I would anticipate would get forced down to the local level. And I know that we're part of a regional consortium right now. Um, are we still awaiting word from the state as to what the expectations are going to be? Or <clears throat> what are we and what are we getting ready for just in case? Because you know, to me, it, it's definitely gonna get forced down to the local level. I, I believe so. They're not gonna get them out unless they do. Sure. Any more information on that? I know this came up the last time as well. Any more information on that, Mr. Gilberto? Uh, it, it is evolving. And um, as many of you saw, there was quite a bit of information that came out in the media the early part of last week with regard to um, first responder vaccination and um, mass vaccina vaccination of residents as well. And um, I, I can tell you that the, I know the public health director has kind of kept us all um, aware that you know we have a dispensary um, plan that calls for the ability to, to um, administer a large number of vaccines to our residents in the event of a public health emergency such as this. However, um, there is still some work going on at the state level and um, admittedly I have not had a COVID uh, meeting with uh, involved folks uh, since Wednesday so I don't I, I may not have the most current information but we were awaiting further gui guidance with regard to our specific role concerning the general population and the issuance of the, uh, the administration of the vaccine. Um, you know, I, I think that we're certainly keenly aware of a strategy where we may be doing that you know, in, a, in, a, in a large volume here in North Reading, um, but we've also heard that there are some efforts underway for potential regional uh, vaccination sites as well. Um, and I've heard of a few you know, fairly large venues that would <laughs> potentially be able to process large numbers of people. We have not heard really anything more than, uh, to my knowledge, at least, uh, than the public has heard on that planning effort. And then the, the, the third model that I will identify just because I think that it's, um, you know, it's an important one for us to be aware of is, you know, the more you know, multiple small locations like the testing is being done or smaller locations. I mean, I think that's certainly an avenue that could materialize um, here with regard to, um, the vaccines yet being made available to pharmacies, to providers, that they may be isolated stand-up sites. So you no, know, we, we're aware that that's a model that has been put out for the vaccine. Certainly do not have any information saying that that will be the model for, for uh, sorry, for the testing. That was a model for the testing. We don't have specific information that it's a model for the vaccine, but I think that we're all aware that that is another model. Um, so, you know, I, I, we're very much, you know, we're very much monitoring what's happening in government in the State Department of Public Health and the CDC uh, sort of above the town because that is very much part of the resource that we get to the vaccine. Um, but I think it will be fair to say that we are in you know, various levels of preparedness for either of these options to take place. <clears throat> Mr. Goberto, I'm assuming that people aren't waiting to attend our meetings to learn about this. When you get this information. I'm, uh, I'm also assuming the State Department of Public Health is working with our Board of Health. And I know Mr. O'Leary will probably have us an update during board reports, but 
as soon as you're getting this information and are you posting it so that if anyone is actually waiting on us for updates, they'll be able to access that on the town website, right, Mr. Gilberto? That's correct. The Board of Health put together a, a dedicated page relative to vaccinations, which we put out in our most recent update. And um, I know that they are updating their pages fairly frequently. So yeah, that's correct, Madam Chair. Okay. okay, so on our website, someone could go to the Board of Health page, uh, the Board of Health link from the most updated info. They, they could, they could also access it through our standing posting on the coronavirus response. Okay. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Studo, I was gonna call you Mr. Vincenzo. That's fine, <laughs> I wanna, gonna start an, I wanna you answer that. to both. Um, <laughs> so go both, just a, a question. Um, is there, right now, you know how it's a regional and state level response, uh, procurement of vaccine distribution. And my question is that, um, way back when when it was more important to, for us to get like you know the protection equipment and the mask it started out as we're going to wait on the state and then two months later we realized that waiting on the state didn't work and it seemed like every community started to become you know who got it from here who got it from there so my question is not that i doubt the you know excellent distribution plan that the state is going to put together however um is there any indication you've gotten talking to your peers even, uh, you know, because right now it's such a sensitive topic, but these are private companies. Is there is there any backup plan that where, if for whatever reason, we're way behind and you see other communities maybe attempting it, that North Reading can try to get the vaccine directly as a municipality if, if it agrees to follow the state guidelines on distribution? Um, so in terms of the town specifically directly procuring, I have not heard of discussions of that going on, at least at this stage of the planning effort. Um, I can tell you that, you know, we did when, when the avenue to sort of regionally access the vaccine became available, we actually followed parallel paths to try to find out which one would work out you know, most expeditiously and the one that worked out most expeditiously is the one that we went with. Um, I'd be happy to report back, though, Mr. O'Leary, through his report, uh, if not later than at our next meeting, I'm sure could report back after the upcoming Board of Health meeting on that issue. Uh, but I don't have a further update than that, Mr. Studio. Yeah. And it's just a question, just because I feel like it's, you know, it, it's unfortunate, but we saw with the protection equipment, especially when we started having issues getting it when it was most needed, kind of like, uh, I don't know, like the toilet paper, that it became every municipality and I didn't agree with it, but it became every municipality for itself. And it just seems that certain communities, they got a jump on something that supposedly we all had to wait and the state was going to take care of, you know, while everybody was, arguing, you know, complaining on these meetings like we were, certain communities seemed to have it figured out quicker because they just assumed faster that the state wasn't going to do what it said it was going to do. So that's why I asked. Sure. Something we'll follow up, Mr. Sudo. On. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Mr. Gilberto. Okay, next order of business is public comment. And do we have anyone in attendance in, that would like to make public comment? I don't see any hands raised. Anyone? Mr. Gilberto, you see anyone? Okay. I don't see any hands raised and I don't see any further comments in the chat. So then we'll, we're gonna move on to the next order of business. And as Mr. Gilberto said, we're joined by Ms. Lutzkowitz, who is our uh, expert on call. I, we have her here for the next order of business on the reviewing the server training auditors for order report. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me everybody. And I'm so glad to hear you um, honored Gloria. She was a good friend of CIT as was said, and I certainly miss all of her uh, phone calls and her articles and getting mail as well that I did over at the police station as well. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, I'm here to kind of review how fourth quarter wrapped up, but also to give you a little overview. Um, it's a very short presentation. Um, Mr. Guerrero, am I able to share my screen? Uh, you should be able to, and if you're not, um, maybe you can ask me to allow it because I, I don't, I'm not aware there's any restriction I put on you. Okay, great. If is that okay to proceed that way? We go with that? Okay, thank you. Sure. Great. Okay, hopefully, let's see. Yes, there we are. Very good. Okay. I thought it was kind of important 
and to put some things in a little bit of historical perspective as an overall alcohol um, campaign. And up front, I just want to remind everybody that our number one goal is prevention. Um, it's not to catch anybody. It is not enforcement. It's to prevent problems down the road, um, you know, from selling to minors, but also um, any sort of um, dramatic or tragedies that could happen as a result of that. And so let me start with a little bit of a timeline overview to refresh everybody's memory. Um, back going back to September 1st of 2019, we had secured a very small grant from Winchester Hospital that allowed us to offer all license holders free training. And that free training was the TIP certification. And before I go on, I just want to clarify that when I say TIPS, I'm actually talking about a brand name. So it's an alcohol server program has, uh, I think there are five companies that offer that, but for the purposes of how I talk about it and how this presentation is, we're going to call it TIPS, although that is um, just a brand name. Um, so we offered this to all license holders and uh, we had a whole bunch of takers, which was wonderful. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, I'm not going to read every bullet point here, but um, I will point out that on December 21st, we had our third um, audit of all licensing for tips. The reason I actually wanted to do four this year, but we skipped the second quarter because of COVID restrictions. Uh, Chief Murphy, rightfully so, didn't think it was smart for me to go and expose um, myself or them to any, you know, kind of reduce our contact there. So we did not do a Q2 audit. We just did three this year. Madam Chair. Oh, Madam Chair, I think you're on mute now. Mr. Cavarro. Can everybody hear Ms. Luckowitz okay? Only because it my yeah. sound seems to be yes. right there. So she's I just, fading. She was fading out. Fading. Okay. Just a little fading. How about I'll try to sit a little closer. Okay. I can only see four of you at a time, so if you wave at me, <laughs> I'll know that you can't hear me, but um, that changes here and there. I can only see four of you at a time. Um, so just moving on a little bit, and I, I know that the select board's intention was always to provide education. So I wanted to give you a little overview of what we did. And as I mentioned back in September of 2019, we offered that free training um, for gift cards to all vendors. And I'm happy to tell you that 68 people, 68 individuals took us up on that offer to be reimbursed for their tips card. Um, the expense to that was $2,165. And that again came from a small Winchester grant. So some of the education involves me physically going into the, the retailer or the venue. And sometimes it, it involves a memo. Uh, the last memo that I sent out was sent on December 21st. And this was one that I handed to everybody during their audit. And it was basically highlighting that we are in a very high risk time. Um, it was going into the holiday season. It was going into New Year's. I also want to remind everybody that they were not um, exempt from checking IDs just because people were wearing masks. This is a question I get asked all the time. What are we supposed to do? Ask them to take their masks down. And I say, absolutely not. This is why you have your tips card. It is so that you are able to use your other skills and your other education to identify fake IDs or underage um, purchase purchases. Um, at, under no circumstances should they be asking people to remove their masks, of course. We also gave them some advice on um, accepting out-of-state IDs, and just as a heads up, you know, reminding everybody about DMV delays due to COVID that people who might have turned 21 might have been delayed in getting their new IDs. I'm gonna give you two examples uh, about what some of our programs involved. Um, these both involved youth and they're my favorite ones. The first one's called Shoulder Tap. And what happens is we have students stand outside of liquor stores. And basically they ask customers who are exiting or excuse me, entering the liquor store or the retailer to purchase beer for them. If the adult says no, they're handed that green card that says, thank you for protecting our youth. If somebody were to agree to purchase the, uh, the student alcohol, they get the card that says think twice. And by doing that ahead of time, nobody could actually be in violation by buying the liquor. And I am very happy to tell you, we gave out 47 no responses and a whole lot of stern uh, lectures were given to the kids. I was nearby as well as Detective Lucci. And I think twice Detective Lucci had to get out of the car and say, no, 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 they're work with us. This is a project. Um, the, the students were excellent in de-escalating the situation just to explain that they were working with the police and um, the community impact team to provide education. 
Uh, but I, I'm happy to tell you that we did not have any adults in North Reading take up that offer to buy them alcohol. Great. Yeah, very happy about that. The second program I'll highlight is called Sticker Shock. Um, this is something that involves retail locations again, but they are volunteers. And we went, we offered this to every retailer in town and said, would you like to partner with us on this? And so I do want to give another shout out to Ryers, Christopher's, Eastgate, One, One Stop and Convenience Plus um, for partner with us. And how this works is, again, our youth action team went into the venue accompanied by North Reading officers, and they put these brightly colored stickers on very popular brands for youth. Uh, so Bud Light, um, Truly, things like that. And they basically highlight what, what the consequences are for purchasing underage. I'll give an additional shout out to Ryers who went one step further and asked us for shelf talkers that could be permanent. And uh, last time I was in Ryers, they were still there. So I really appreciate that. And it kind of inspired us to reach out to these vendors this year to see if anybody else wants to do the permanent shelf talkers. And that's something that I'll pay for through the DFC grant. <clears throat> so here is an overview of our results. Um, as I mentioned, Q2, we did have COVID shutdowns. Quarter one, we had a total of six violations. Quarter two, we had three. And last quarter, just a couple of weeks ago, we only had two. So that's actually a decrease from early in the year of about 66%. Um, so 62, I'm pretty happy with that. And again, um, what we definitely don't wanna see a repeat violation. So that can be a little bit frustrating. We can talk about that if you have more questions, but um, they all know I'm coming. Uh, Mr. Guevara's office sent out um, just a reminder that I'm doing that at the beginning of the year. And through visiting them so often, uh, I think I've developed some relationships. It's unfortunate that we have violations at all um, because there really is no excuse, especially when I go and do a visit right before licensing because they have to provide you with that information during their licensing. So I wanna talk about that in just a second. Um, another strategy related to compliance is operated by North Reading uh, detectives. So this is something that I don't do, the detectives do it. And there's uh, three technical different ways to do that. One is an observation. We had three dates this year. Again, very happy that there were no violations. We had retail undercover, which did have three violations, including one repeat violation. I think that you're all aware of that and have um, a discussion later about that. And the last one is a, um, the other type of un undercover, which is basically to a restaurant. Because of COVID pro um, prohibitions, we can't do that because basically right now, Massachusetts regulations say that if you go in to purchase an alcoholic beverage, you need to also purchase food. We don't wanna expose the students to additional contacts. So we were not able to do um, restaurant and club undercovers, but typically we would do that or we would coordinate that with the NRPD detectives. So having gone through a whole year of this, um, I do have a couple of recommendations that I would love to chat with you about. And the first is to close that 30 day tips window. Um, currently the regulations say that if somebody hires somebody, they have 30 days to get their tips certification. But uh, as Chief Murphy always says, we don't allow somebody to drive a car for 30 days without having their license. I think it exposes the venue to an awful large liability. I think it exposes the server to a lot of liability. And more importantly to me, it's, it's concern for um, selling to underage or even overselling. I wanna, I wanna highlight that too, that the tips training includes how to prevent over-serving adults as well. And that, that's something that's important as well. The second recommendation is to require cards to be kept on site. Part of my follow-up when I do a visit every quarter is it takes so long because I have to go and go back to a venue to say, okay, do you have that person's card yet? I know. They didn't have it on them the day that I visited, but do you have a copy of it now? They might email that to me. They might text it to me. They might um, put it in the mail to me. And I've asked everybody after the, after the first one to have it on them. However, it's not a regulation that they have to keep the cards on site. Um, my best case recommendation is that the original card be kept with the server. They own it. It's, it's almost like your CPR card. Think of it that way. You own it but that the employer should keep a copy of it in their office on site. Um, this is an example like with Teresa's who has a main office in Middleton that keeps them at Middleton. You know, that does me no good when I'm visiting here in North Reading. And the third recommendation is to provide a roster at the time of relicensing. 
Um, I was able to review uh, with Mrs. Marlin and Mrs. Brooks help the applications for relicensing. And I had people who I knew worked there that were not showing up on what they submitted to you, or I should say that the, their cards were not submitted to you. There's no real way for me to know a date of hire um, unless I ask the person. And, and in this case, and I can review this with you, my last one, I had somebody who was not able to prove that their date of hire. Um, so my recommendation is that at the time of relicensing, re they provide a roster to you with their tips card and their date of hire. And that is because if we don't close that 30 day tips window, then I'll know from date of hire. If we close the 30 day window, they that before they go on the floor. And just something for, uh, for the board to consider is, um, is each person without a certificate a violation or is it one per licensee? Because that has happened a couple of times. And so I'll open up to questions. I always kind of um, leave it here too that, you know, just a reminder to the community who might be watching or watching through NORCAM, um, we do have an anonymous text to tip line uh, app. It's free, it's called the P3 app. You can also call the North Reading Police anonymous tip line. Nobody answers that phone. It goes to a voicemail automatically and the detectives monitor that. You can also go through the link through the police website and also the North Reading Public School app has a link to our anonymous uh, tips app. So I will stop the share and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, just a quick question. Thank you, Amy. Good. Very informative. But on those recommendations, are those things that uh, we could just implement as far as the uh, relicensing application? Um, so is this part of our requirements? It, it wouldn't run in conflict with the ABCC or anybody? No. Oh, uh, um, it, I, I don't believe it will. And, and I was, was going to answer for you, but. <laughs> uh, oh, well, we, we so, the, have, so the answer we, is? We do have board policies, but I think we also have broad authority as the local licensing authority to implement whatever rules and regulations that we need to to ensure compliance with the law. And Amy has actually made other recommendations previously to us that we might want to consider by way of a policy update in just implementing these certain requirements or others to just help help them do their job and help our licensees to remain compliant. Just on the 30 day um, recommendation, I mean, if someone's going to be hired, you know, a new hire, it's almost like, are you going to require them to have the tips training before they can start working? Is that the suggestion here or? So the idea, yes, that is the suggestion um, for a couple of reasons. The first is, you know, def when I was employed by the YMCA, for example, I was not allowed to work until I had my CPR certification. Um, it's really to protect the licensee. The other thing is because these online certificates only take about two hours, uh, it is my opinion that it's very reasonable. Just like you would go through serve safe or choke safety or allergen awareness, there should be one more layer of protection for the server to add into their training before they're allowed to be um, on the floor. Now, there is a little wiggle room where you could say the person is not allowed to serve alcohol nor take an alcohol order without that. You do have that ability to make that caveat. Um, but again, that would take some sort of monitoring to watch if they what, what's going on. Even a, and when I say serve, I mean just carrying it from the bar to the table would be considered serving it. So you do have a little wiggle room there to decide that. But I, in my opinion, it's just like making sure everybody has their folk safe, allergen awareness, that sort of thing. I mean, that was my, my, my next question. Instead of asking it is, you know, how detailed is it to, to get the certification? You said a couple of hours? Uh, no more than two hours. All right, so that's, that's not unreasonable. Okay, thank you. And the cost is about, well, the, I can tell you the online uh, tips class is $40. I'm gonna ask you that, thank you. Any other questions? And that's something yeah, just what about the availability of training and trainers though? Oh, sorry, say that again? You, know, you said the training, is that just online training, but is there also, in-house training that takes place? Not in it? addition to, it would be either or. Either or. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so if an establishment decides that it's, it's, it's better training to have in-house face-to-face training to trainer rather than online answer the questions until you get it right. Uh, Your discretion. 
So that that might be a little bit more of a an obstacle as far as the 30 day requirement. Um, I can tell you that Kitties is a really good example of that. They pay for a trainer to come in and take care of all of their staff in one. But let's say you have somebody mid year or well after that, then the online option might be better for them. Um, I've taken both classes because I wanted the experience of which one was better. There are pros and cons of each of the each one of those. Um, what I like about the in person training is that you can ask real life kind of scenario questions to a trainer and say, you know, I've had this come up before in the past. How would you have handled that? You don't get that back and forth in an online training. Um, what I do like about an online training is I find it to be extremely thorough. It covered a lot of detail. Um, the other benefit of an in-person training is that it usually can address local laws where an online training uh, sometimes not. And I say sometimes because remember there's about five companies that do it. Right, okay. So, so there's a, there could be a scheduling problem for the local establishments if you're gonna do the in-house person-to-person -person training. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, and all I, of the licenses to my knowledge last three years. Okay. Okay, just something to consider, you know, if, if the owner of the establishment thinks the face-to-face -face is a better idea, then if we impose the, they can't work within that 30 days, that might present a, a problem, that's all. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good, so I guess for another day. Yeah. Any other questions, comments? Mr. Studo? No. All set, Mr. Walner? All set, Mrs. Gonzalez? Um, Amy, after the three years, is that, um, do they have to take the, the whole thing again, or is it like a review? The whole thing again. The whole thing. It's not, it doesn't <clears throat> offer, right now, I, I, everything could change, you know, because these companies are private. Um, right now, there is no refresher course. All set, Mrs. Gonzalez? Yes, I am. Thank you. I just wanted to thank you for all the good work that you're doing and all the detail that you're providing us and also appreciate that every time you do come and talk to us, you're not just giving us a presentation, you're giving us some suggestions as the other person in the field that we rely on to tell us what might be helpful to us. So I appreciate thank that you. as well. Thank you. If you're looking for some language related to any of these, you know, I would love to participate in that, um, especially this 30 day window. Um, you know, probably does not have to wait until next year between relicensing. You know, some of these things are uh, actionable items now. So that's, I'm excited to do that. And if you need help with that, please let me know. We'll, we'll be creating the, uh, creating the language a little bit together as we go, because um, as Mr. O'Leary asked, you know, what's, what's the flexibility of the authority to do that? And I, to my knowledge, North Reading would be uh, among the few to do that, to close those windows and loopholes. And I think I can offer some of my professional experience in that regard, because we have a pretty comprehensive set of rules and regulations for our licensees where I work. And um, we, we also have specific regulations relating to all, but also to retail and restaurant. And I, that one of the distinctions I see here that you've raised to us is that we put the burden upon the licensee to produce and provide that information. So for example, when a new hire is made, it's at that point that the establishment has to fill out and file with the licensing board, an employee, uh, a, a, a form and a new, a new hire form with, with the board so that when anyone is going in there, they're gonna know who they're talking to. It's the same with the TIP certification. It's just a requirement that anyone in that establishment that's doing sales and service must be TIP certified at the time that they're hired. So because of this, the availability of the training, anyone can take it at any time. We can take it if we want to and become TIP certified. That it, it's not really a burden to be placed upon us or you to have to follow up. It really should be something worded so that the licensee who's granted this license should comply with those requirements. And then if someone's let go, alerting the select board, you know, this individual is no longer working with our establishment, things like that. So I think, uh, you know, rather than you having to continuously follow up, maybe we can write something in our 
policies that would be requiring the licensee to do that and then sharing that with, you know, we can, you know, have an, a public hearing on it and share with the licensees that we're intending to implement these new requirements and, and you know, give some more public attention to it. But again, like, you know, I, go ahead, I'm sorry. I think, you know, we can definitely do as much as, or I can do as much as possible to make that transition easy for them. Um, one of the suggestions I would have that would be that if there was the requirement for a roster, that we can create a template for them. I mean, a very low lift thing that, so that they're all uniform. Um, I looked at the, like I said, the relicensing from this year and a document from one vendor might look totally different from another where I'm searching for the information and they provide us, you know, employee ID numbers. I don't need that. I don't want that. Um, you know, just, just because that's their own internal system. So if we provide them with a simple template that they could plug and play, I would love to do that. Um, anything, like I said, anything we can do to make it as easy as possible. I am optimistic that, you know, especially closing that 30 day window and requiring cards to be kept on site are things that we can take um, action on without again, waiting another full year. Great, sure. Well, any other questions, Thanks. comments? You appreciate appreciate your coming in, and thank you for sure. the presentation too and the work. Happy, yeah, happy New Year, everybody. Stay happy well. Year. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye you. Everybody. Our next order of business is to schedule a show cause hearing for Route Twenty Eight Lucky Mart. I hope to schedule a hearing and. Um, this is uh, an establishment that we already at, had before us for a show cause here. And so it is not a mistake. We do need to bring them back in for our, uh, it's the same exact type of violation. So we're trying to pick a date for that. Mr. Gilberto, um, we'll, we'll defer to you because we know that you have to get the written notification out on behalf of the board and give enough time for the licensee and advance notice of that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, that's correct. And we are proposing you know, scheduling a show cause hearing for um, Monday, January 25th at 8.15 p.m. Um, and um, we would issue a notification if the board so voted that. Um, we'll also make sure that we forward the licensee the copy of all reports that were um, associated with this incident as well. That is not something that has occurred in the past, but I think it was a recommendation from one or more board members over the past couple of weeks uh, to consider doing that to expedite things for the uh, the licensee to come up to speed or for their council if they actually have council. So we'll make sure we do that as well. And so in, in, keeping, in keeping with our process, I believe we take a vote as a board to schedule that on, um, at your request. So that's why it's on the agenda this evening. That's so correct. Do we have a motion uh, or any further discussion on that or? Do we have a motion? Yep. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to schedule a show cause hearing for Smokes and Snakes Inc. Snacks Inc. DBA Route 28 Lucky Mar for Monday, January 25th, 2021 at 8.15 p.m. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. <coughs> Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Manny Pelli is aye. Okay. Uh, we do have a next order of business at 8 p.m. So how about if I will, it's not quite eight yet. I actually can't believe I'm saying that we're ahead of schedule for a change. Okay, sure. <laughs> so why don't we, um, we'll wait to call that to eight, but why don't we move on to class two license? <clears throat> application Honda Motor Vehicle Sales LLC vote to approve the license. And do we have um, any? Okay, Attorney Latham's here. Welcome. Thank you very much. Can you folks hear me okay? Yes, we can. Excellent. Uh, we submitted an application uh, with various data required by statute. Uh, we included a certificate of good standing. Uh, repair facility agreement to show that to the extent any repairs are required by law or under warranty that would be covered at a uh, appropriate facility. Uh, we also submitted a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals as a result of a public hearing uh, to allow this facility at uh, 33 Cedar Street. <clears throat> um, we did uh, attach to the application uh, an explanation of the nature of this use because this 
it's the way of the future, but it's different from the past. And that is that the, uh, this business really is conducted by way of auction, uh, internet auction, or at remote auction facilities. Uh, there'd be no used cars displayed or sold in the town of North Reading. Uh, the office, however, is located in North Reading. Uh, and I've described in the application the two ways this works. Uh, either the applicant has a direct relationship with a particular individual and goes out and acquires a vehicle for that individual at an auction, and then either delivers the vehicle to the buyer or the buyer picks it up at the auction house himself. Uh, the alternative approach uh, is a, uh, is a uh, situation where the client purchases for investment purposes for resale. Uh, and what that would happen there is it'd be purchased on day one and could be resold at the same auction house that afternoon or maybe shipped to a different auction house and resold. Uh, the applicant does have a relationship with Lyft and Uber. And uh, of course, as we know, Uber drivers put a lot of mileage on their car. As a consequence, their, their customers looking for good secondhand vehicles uh, at affordable prices. So as a consequence of that, that's a service that the applicant intends to provide uh, as part of this if he obtains the license itself. And that pretty much is an overview, uh, Madam Chair. More than happy to answer any questions. I think uh, Omar is here. I can't tell from uh, looking at the phone numbers, so. Uh, Madam Chair, just for the record. Yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. O'Leary. I have a family member who uh, holds a class two license in the town of North Reading, so I will not be participating in the discussion, um, voting on it, so I will be abstaining. And I, I'm actually going to sign off. Mr. O'Leary, I apologize for not letting you do that in advance. Mr. O'Leary always does that at the outset of these hearings. But do the members have any questions for Attorney Latham? I guess I would just ask, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not very familiar with this business model at all. Is the business model you described fairly routine practice across the United, uh, across the Massachusetts, or is it uh, something novel? And though it's actually nationwide at this point, it, it is relatively new in the sense of uh, sale of used motor vehicles, but it's a growing business. I think it's existed probably for a year or more, but it's getting more common. Uh, in fact, the Commonwealth uh, is now participating as well. Uh, and there are some co national companies that do nothing but online auctions. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Mrs. Gonzalez, are you all set? I am. Thank you. Mr. Studo, are you all set? I'm all set. I just have a couple. Oh, all right, Mr. Gilbert. I had a couple guys? of questions to Mr. Gilberto. Oh, I'm sorry. I did not have any questions. I did want to respond to a couple of things that came up from the board members' comments. So um, I can wait till the end, though, if you'd like, Madam Chair. Okay. I just wanted to have a couple of questions to Attorney Latham. Is this a zero storage license? It's a class two uh, license uh, under the statute. I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, there'd be no vehicles on site. So for how many vehicles would this be as he is your client seeking? Uh, perhaps if he's here, he could respond to that particularly. I think it's, it's in and out, so it's not a large number. I don't see him uh, appearing. Yeah. I believe he just signed in. Attorney. Okay, thank you. I think I only saw a couple of this, but I didn't see anything uh, specific to that. So uh, that's why I wanted to take the opportunity to ask on this here so that I could understand it's by auction. So it's basically being bought at the auction and then transported to the particular individual. That's how I understood your paperwork. That's absolutely correct. There's no inventory really level that's maintained. So in other words, it's not gonna be, you know, buying seven vehicles at auction, putting them on a lot with for sale signs on the, on the road at the business. Absolutely not. So is this, um, is your client in this business in any other community? No. Was your client in this business in any other community? To my knowledge, this is the first time that he's applied for a license. For a class two dealer's license? Yes, I believe the police department's done a search. I don't know if they check 
uh, that sort of historical use, but I'm not aware of any prior history of this. I think this is his first effort. He's been in the uh, motor vehicle business, but not in this capacity. So, but ha there's, you're not aware and he hasn't lost his class two dealer's license in any other community. He has not, and he's uh, sworn to that in this affidavit, his application. Okay. And my other question to, um, my other question on this packet too has to do with um, the, the um, sorry, I'm scrolling back up to me. I'm sorry. Um, the, his bonding to be able to do this, does he, did he submit that with his application? The, yes, that, that was actually submitted shortly after the application, but the town does in fact have it. Okay, because I didn't see it in the packet, but I just wanted to make sure that was also in place. It, it has been submitted together with the workers' comp affidavit. Okay. Oh, Madam Chair, through you both are receiving sure. today. And, and Mr. Gilberto, did you have other um, things that you wanted to address the board on with respect to this license? Uh, Madam Chair, the, the comments that I wanted to offer for the board are that we, we do have another licensee with a very similar arrangement. Um, I believe it's under the name of Brian, Brian Dushak um, here in town who um, is operating uh, effectively an office, um, but not uh, storing vehicles on site here. So there is Another example that's out there, um, as Attorney Latham indicated, um, they did apply for the requisite home occupation special permit and received it in November. Um, there were no appeals and that special permit is now in effect. Um, we have received the required documentation. The police department has done the required uh, background check in accordance with our um, bylaw and the board's policies and the information that uh, came to uh, came to light was that uh, everything appeared to be in order. Um, the police department's not aware of any previous um, operation that this business has had um, as well. And I think just the, uh, the final note is that as a result of the Board of Appeals special permit and the information that was indicated in the application, you'll see that the motion we have prepared includes two conditions which tie back to the um, special permit itself, um, as well as um, the um, limitation that it be for administrative office functions only. Okay, yeah, I see that on the on the uh, notice of decision that it's not, no cars are gonna be allowed to be stored on the site or anything. I was trying to figure out how, how this particular thing complied with the statute where there was no place of business for second hand, but because of that, I think in the, that covers it, that uh, special, I guess that special permit covers it. So so that makes sense to me. I don't know if there's any other questions or comments um, and all set, uh, if, if we're all set. Mr. Gilberto, anything else? Madam Chair, I did not have anything further um, with regard to this. Again, as I indicated, um, and Attorney Latham will hear the, um, the conditions that we're proposing, which I think tied back directly to the application. All right, so do we have a motion? We do. Madam Chair, I move to approve the class two license for Honka Motor Vehicles LLC, uh, Vehicle Sales LLC, subject to the following conditions. Operations under this license at 33 Cedar Street shall be limited to administrative office functions. Licensees shall follow all conditions of the special permit issued by the Zoning Board of Appeals dated November 5th, 2020 and filed with the town clerk, November 17, 2020. I have a motion by Mr. Studo. Do I have a second? Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. Walner. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. Studo? Aye. Mr. Walner? Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez? Aye. Manu Pelli is aye, and Mr. O'Leary is recused. And it passes. So, thank luck. you very much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you, and good luck. Thank you. All right, Mr. O'Leary has returned, and um, we're going to move on to the next order of business, which is an uh, eight o'clock nuisance or dangerous dog hearing, April eighteen, Maple Road. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, in the um, 
early part of December, the town was provided a formal request for a hearing um, with regard to dangerous dogs located at 18 Maple Road. Um, and this was a result of uh, a few incidents that occurred um, in November of 2020 or thereabouts. Um, as uh, some may know, the town does have a bylaw which requires a follow-up investigation which the animal control officer conducted in the month of December. Um, there was a report that was generated um, to me um, on, I believe, December 21st, provided to the select board and this hearing was scheduled uh, in accordance with that report. Um, and you know, you'll see in the report, which I believe um, both the owner of the dog and uh, there was a representative of, I think, the, some of the impacted residents who uh, we provided a copy to as well. And um, I see a number of residents in the neighborhood that have come on here this evening. So uh, clearly information has been circulated with regard to this, which was the intent in circulating that information back to the um, original resident who stepped forward. Um, and so you have before you a, um, a formal report of the animal control officer, as well as a series of recommendations with regard to this dog, these dogs, excuse me. The dogs are currently under a uh, temporary order that was issued by the animal control officer um, almost two weeks ago um, with regard to um, a, a muzzle order on the, uh, on the animals anytime they are outside of the, uh, the homes. Um, Subsequent to this, uh, sometime maybe a week or so after we issued the hearing notice, we did request, as I think the board members are aware, we did receive, excuse me, as the board members are aware, are, 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 are aware a request from the, the attorney for the dog owner requesting a continuance of this hearing um, to a future date um, so that he could attend. And so I believe that you have that request in your packet um, from the attorney the discussions that we've had with the attorney are such that you know, no such request would be brought forward unless there was an agreement on the part of the uh, dog owner and the attorney that the temporary order of the animal control officer that the dog be muzzled um, would be in effect uh, until the date of any continued hearing. Um, and so Madam Chair, I think you are aware we were hoping that we would receive something in writing from the owner of the dog um, himself in time for the meeting this evening. We did not receive that. And sometime I think around six o'clock or so this evening, we did receive communication from town council that town council had been in touch with council for the uh, dog owner indicating that they were, that he was committed to following um, the temporary order of the animal control officer, not just through its expiration, but until the date of the continued hearing, if it were to be continued. And so, Madam Chair, as you know, that's, I think, where we stand at this point. If I've missed anything, certainly feel free to add anything further. Well, I, I understand that there has been some back and forth, um, but this public hearing was scheduled. And in the packet, there are at least 13 residents who have noted their concern. So given that this has been scheduled and the dog owner was aware of it, I think it was really incumbent upon the owners to put in writing to the board that they would agree to comply with those terms and conditions in seeking the continuance, at least until, you know, we could have this full hearing. And because that didn't happen, that's why it's being called, um, you know, this evening. So we needed something in writing confirming from the owner of this dog, the compliance. So while we do give great leeway to the requests of council on behalf of um, you know, individuals that are appearing before us, we do need something in writing confirming that. And this is a safety matter that we don't just have one complaint, we have at least 13 complainants here. So um, that my thought would be that we move forward with the hearing uh, because we don't have anything in writing with the owner. So I'll defer to my colleagues on your thought on that, but it has been scheduled and we'll, I guess I'll, I'll just, uh, you know, quickly elicit response from the members if they would like to move forward on this to this evening. Mr. O'Leary. I mean, yeah, generally, I mean, I'd like to know that they're in compliance with, with what the dog officer and the animal control officer has asked them to, to do. Um, and I had hoped because the town administrator informed me a couple of days ago, you know, that there was a request to um, 
postpone the heating, hearing to a future day so long as we had written compliance. So we didn't get that. That's of concern. So again, Mr. Gilberto, there was no other follow up with the attorney? Uh, there was a email correspondent. My understanding is there was an email correspondence from town council to the attorney for the dog owner. And that that uh, I believe was followed up with a telephone conversation late this afternoon where there was every indication that we would receive something. Um, but I think Madam Chair indicated that that would not be received until tomorrow. And, you know, I did, I did relay to, um, to town council that, you know, because of the safety issues at, at stake here, that it was imperative that we have something, um, you know, in writing here in advance of the hearing. So moving forward, Mr. O'Leary. I would say we have to we should, we yeah. move forward and then we can decide after what we hear or whether we want to continue it, you know, to the next meeting. So is, is the owner of the dog not here? Mr. the guy? The owner of the dog. Put your hand no, up. I'm not the owner. Which, no. what, what are you referring to? The owner of the the, the, the attacking dogs? The two dogs, yes. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, no. dogs. Yeah. So, so Mr. Glynis is not attack. present and his attorney is not present? I do not see either. I do not see anyone raising their hand identifying. It's it's it looks like two dogs owned by Mr. and Mrs. Guide is the is the subject. Uh, two pit bulls at 18 Maple Road. Is there anyone here from 18 Maple Road, owner of the dogs? Is there anyone um, to be able to come forward as the owner? So I don't. I don't even think they're joining us this evening for the meeting. So that's also a pretty significant red flag for me. Uh, Mr. Walner, let's hear your preference. Do you want to move forward with this or? Yes, I, I consider this an urgent matter. I think we need to move forward tonight. Mrs. Gonzalez. I agree, this is a public safety matter and I think we should move forward. All right, Mr. Studo, are you in agreement with that? You'd be in the minority at this point if you weren't, so. <laughs> no, I, I I, am. I mean, I have a dog and I would have at least uh, showed up, not, you know, not the assumed uh, close by the attorney saying, if I don't hear from you by January 8th, we're just not going to show up because we think everything's good. Yeah. Okay. You know, not, I don't know about that letter. Okay, so why don't we proceed? We're going to call the public hearing to order it is 8 10 uh, p.m um, and this is with regard to dangerous dogs two pit bulls at 18 maple road in our packet are listed multiple pages of reports and we do have chief murphy joining us so um we did have chief murphy we do we do have chief murphy if chief murphy if you'd be able to just give us a okay mr gilberto i'm sorry madam chair i'm just realizing that uh, the way the discussion began i don't believe we read the notice of here and i don't know if we want to do that um, i apologize okay let me go back to that in the packet i'm sorry mr gilberto okay it's page 60. six thank you This is a notice of public hearing, and it was also by hand delivery to Mr. Edward Guide, 18 Maple Road, North Reading, Mass, 01864, hand delivered December 31st. It's a notice of hearing in nuisance or dangerous dogs on January 11th, 2021 at 8 p.m. The North Reading Select Board will hold a virtual public hearing in accordance with Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 140, Section 157, to determine whether the two dogs owned and or kept by you in the town of North Reading, named Jaeger, Jaeger and Patron, are nuisance or dangerous dogs as those terms are defined in said statute. This notice is based on multiple written complaints of said dogs routinely running at large, trespassing on private property, and attacking or attempting to attack other dogs and injuring a person while off the property at 18 Maple Road. Copies of these complaints are enclosed herewith. In accordance with its statutory authority, the board will conduct a virtual public hearing which shall include an examination of the complainants under oath and based on the credible evidence and testimony presented, 
may make such findings and orders concerning the restraint or disposal of said dogs as may be deemed necessary. You may participate in the virtual hearing at the, and at that time you may produce any documentation and or witnesses. You may be represented by counsel at your own expense if you so choose. Instructions for joining our virtual meeting with the virtual meeting link and phone numbers um, included in the notice of hearing and request to call the town administrator's office if there are any questions. Um, and so again, we have, we're joined by multiple residents. We received at least uh, complaints from at least 13 different residents, but we'll uh, turn to Mr. Uh, our Chief, Chief Murphy, to give us a, just a brief background with regard to the complaints made. Thank you, Madam Chair. I apologize for not having a video um, of myself this evening, but um, if I could just summarize, I wanted to read into um, the record, the summary that was given to me by our animal control officer, Jerry Berg, uh, which was dated December 19th, 2020. Um, in addition to the summary, he did submit several um, written complaints from neighbors um, that have had um, ongoing issues with, with the dogs that are in question. So I'll read into the, into the record, the summary. Um, the summary uh, is of log entries um, that were made over November 25th, 2020 through December 7th regarding two pit bulls owned by Edward Guide of 18 Maple Road. On November 25th, um, animal control officer was dispatched by police officers um, along with two other offices in the fire department um, to an address on Juniper Street in North Rand in regards to a dog attack that had just occurred. When the officers arrived on scene, he spoke with a resident of five Winterberry Lane um, and, and that his dog, um, a golden retriever, had been attacked by two pit bulls that were off leash owned by Edward Guide of 18 Maple Road. Um, the owner of the, the victim dog, um, had indicated that the dog, that he was bit on the left hand on his thumb and index finger. He was treated on scene by the fire department. Um, the resident and his wife transported their dog to Reading Animal Clinic for multiple wounds and abrasions. Um, we did have a report from them as well, which uh, was attached to the documents they submitted to the town administrator. Uh, there were two witnesses, um, two additional witnesses um, and their voluntary statements were, were attached and submitted as well. Uh, we also submitted photographs of the dog's injuries um, in our summary to the town administrator. On November 25th at approximately 10.30 a.m., the animal control officer went to 18 Maple Road and spoke with the owner of the two dogs, Edward Guide, about um, the dog bite. Um, and um, as a result, of, the, of that conversation, Mr. Guy had said that both of his dogs um, were, were in fact involved and the animal control officer ordered that they be quarantined for 10 days. Mr. Guy was given a citation in hand for um, having um, unleashed dogs, unlicensed dogs and unvaccinated against rabies on both, both of his dogs. They, he was explained the rabies protocols um, and um, it, on November 29th, um, the owner did contact the animal control officer and had said his wife had rabies vaccination paperwork on both of their dogs. He did provide that proof of vaccination, um, which was issued um, and expired on March of 2022. Um, the, the, the citation was then voided um, and he was issued a, a second violation for just unleashed on license for both dogs. On December 2nd, he followed up um, again from a call that happened on December 1st. Uh, this is in regards to the two pit bulls again from Mr. Guide's 18 Maple Road. Uh, the dogs were running loose on the neighbor's back porch at 21 Maple Road. A police officer had to respond to the call as well. Um, and um, Mr. Guy was told that he was in violation of the previously issued quarantine and leash law violations. Um, he went to speak with Mr. Guide again. 
um, and spoke to him about the quarantine order and the violation. He issued a second citation in hand uh, for a subsequent leash law violation um, because of the dogs being off leash on December 1st, um, 2020 at approximately 7.30 in the evening. At that point, um, the animal control officer had ordered Mr. Guy to muzzle his dogs for the rest of the quarantine and informed him that the state would be notified due to the quarantine violation, which they were. Um, the animal control officer, I had asked him to reach out to the actual owner of the property, um, Mr. Farazani, who lives at 36 Maple Road, uh, regarding um, assisting us with having the pit bulls removed um, to a, a, a different community or um, um, asking Mr. Farzani at least for cooperation in removing both dogs because of the neighborhood safety and liability concerns. At the time, Mr. Farzani said he would speak to the owner of the dogs um, and demand that the dogs were removed from the property. On December 7th, the animal control officer went back, spoke to Mr. Guide, um, both of the dogs at that point looked um, fine to him and the quarantine order uh, was released. Um, I had conversations with the animal control officer and I had uh, asked that Mr. Guide, um, we urged that he have the dogs removed from his home. Um, originally, Mr. Guide was in agreement and at some point um, he said he was not cooperating with us anymore. And um, as a result of the numerous complaints from the neighbors, the dog bites, um, the lack of cooperation from Mr. Guide, um, the animal, I had ordered the animal control officer to um, write a report, request a hearing in front of the select board to have the dogs, um, uh, at least have all the information presented to you so that you can make a decision on um, the next course of action with the two dogs. Do the members have any questions of Chief Murphy, Mr. O'Leary? Uh, so Chief, what are our options? I, I, I understand that the laws have changed where we can't just, you know, shoot them to another community and move the problem somewhere else. But, you know, so what are our options? Um, so you have several options. I, I can read you what the, um, what the bylaw says. Okay, options, options, and then do you have a recommendation? We do have a recommendation. Um, so, what would you like to hear first? Let's hear what the let's hear what our ability to act is and what the standard is under the bylaw, please. And then I do also think um, there was some pretty specific recommendations made by the animal control officer. It's on page sixty-four in our packet. But before we get to that point, we also have to hear there's multiple complainants that have joined us and we'd like to take their, you know, testimony in this hearing as well. So if you can tell us, Chief Murphy, what the standard is that we're supposed to be looking at and what our ability to act is like Mr. O'Leary is acting under the bylaw, that would be appreciated. Sure, so um, under the North Rank Bylaw 23-7, restraint or muzzling, um, there are several um, reasons why um, the animal control officer can um, issue an interim order to restrain or muzzle, which is not to exceed 14 days, um, which he has done that. And section B of, of that, um, the bylaw says upon restraining or muzzling or issuing an interim order to restrain or muzzle, the animal control officer shall submit in writing to the selectman, a report of his actions and the reasons therefore. Upon receipt of such report, the selectman may make such order concerning the restraint, muzzling or disposal of such dog as may be deemed necessary. If the selectman fail to act upon the report during the period the dog is restrained or muzzled, upon expiration of the period, the interim order is automatically vacated. And on page 64 of our packet, there is a, a December 31st muzzle order from officer, the animal control officer. And he also actually makes recommendations such as ordering both dogs to be confined. Is this the guide hearing? Is this the hearing on guide? Yes. Who's, okay, this was that? continued to February 8th. This is attorney Jeremy Cohen with Boston right. Dog Lawyers, I represent Mr. Guide. I have on it, I have from me, your attorney. attorney. Excuse me, Attorney Cohen? Yes. Uh, 
where we, we opened the public hearing Why? because we, we did not have uh, documentation from the owner agreeing to the conditions that were placed. So we That's did not, not true. That is not true. This is a, this is an un unlawful hearing. You have it. I spoke to your attorney tonight. We guaranteed it. He wanted it in his office tomorrow morning. How dare you hold this hearing tonight after you told me February 8th? There was no there was nothing told to me to put this in writing. I'm doing it as a courtesy to the lawyer who reached out to me at about six o'clock tonight. This you you must shut this hearing down right now. You, you can attorney it. Cohen, attorney Cohen, we have opened the hearing. No, you need to close it. Well, you're doing the wrong thing. Attorney Cohen, we have opened this hearing. We have considered this to be a dangerous, dangerous oh, circumstance. You, you don't know what dangerous is. You're some breaking the law right now. Excuse me, Attorney Cohen. And we dangerous. wanted some confirmation from your client that your client would be agreeable in writing to complying with the conditions it, until they never said writing. I, it never said I, writing. I'm, I'm going to actually have the, have the town administrator, you, you, if you cannot respect the decorum of this forum. Decorum. We're in the midst of a public hearing. You need to close but it. Written confirmation, because this is, an, a, this is a serious public safety concern, oh. and we've got multiple individuals attending this public hearing. What you're doing is a serious get, public safety violation. Attorney Kong, please do not interrupt. But well, we can talking. hear from you to present your client's case. You are here. No, and I'm not here. Else. I'm leaving the hearing. Every one of you, I can't believe you did this. Your lawyer, Brian Riley, I have it in writing. This is not supposed to happen. You, I don't know why you're not listening to me, but why don't you call your lawyer before you continue to hold an unlawful hearing? She, I, this is unbelievable. I'll send you everything right now. This Is this North Reading? Because I heard, I heard what North Reading is going to be like. And now I'm seeing it. I have it right here that you continued the hearing. This is dangerous for everybody in the town because you gave, you, I have it in writing that you continued the hearing. You violated my client's due process Attorney rights. Cohen, what are you going to do about that right now? Attorney Cohen. You got to shut this hearing down. Position, it might you got to close it. No, you must shut this hearing down. You to stop interrupting me and get to your client and make sure your client in writing I, agrees to comply. I'm, I'm on. on I'm on right here. Please I'm do not, ma'am, ma'am. We're having a public hearing. Mr. Gilbert, I'm the public. So muting. Wait a second. So we can invite people to participate as they're identified and called forward. We have multiple people that want to participate. Attorney Cohen, it might be who of you to get to your client. We don't have anything in writing from your client. We have multiple people who are notified to be here for this public hearing. So that's not my problem. I was notified that, to not be here. That, if that's so my client position, is on the line right now. She's right Cohen. there. She's attorney right Cohen. there. Well, that's what North Reading does. Okay, <laughs> then if you and your client are here, we will hear from you in due course. We're no, in the get off the line. Of We're out. Yep. This is an unlawful yep. hearing. How dare you? I, I will be in court this week against all of you. I have it in writing. So I was told North Reading was going to be like this uh, because you don't like my client. This is this is unreal. I, I don't know your. I question. have it in writing. Who, and who are you? And why aren't you speaking up, Mr. Gilbero? You you were involved in all this. Attorney Cohen. Why aren't you speaking up? Attorney Cohen, do you want to make a presentation on behalf of your client? Who no, because you, you violated our due process here? rights. Because I don't have the Madam hearing Chair. date until February eighth. I have it right here. Madam so, Chair. Yes, Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Attorney Cohen. There was a discussion that took place between Attorney Riley and yourself regarding this hearing being continued upon the town receiving confirmation that the guys would follow the interim order not only for the 14 day period, but through until the rescheduled date. That's not true. And no. then there was a follow up request, it. sir. I'm, I'm speaking. There was a follow up request that was made to you on Thursday asking for it in writing or electronically from your client. No, it wasn't, it wasn't received. Attorney Riley, I'm told, followed up at least once, if not twice today with you to obtain that so that we would have that information liar, liar, prior to the start liar, of the hearing. Liar, liar. And at the moment, I still do not have that information. Call your lawyer. Is that incorrect? I spoke to him two hours ago. He said, I'll just get it to me tomorrow. I said, I'll have it for you tomorrow morning if you want. He's like, oh, that, that soon? That's great. You, you're playing in an area that you shouldn't be because you relied on your lawyer to communicate with me, right? 
and we did that. There's nothing. I spoke to him two hours ago. He moved it to June 20, January 25th, and then they moved it to February 8th. We have a valid defense, and I'm, it, but we moved this. He already, I already confirmed that he was um, complying. I've been asked twice myself to confirm verbally that I would confirm with him. And I said to Brian Riley, sure, I'll call him right now. Just got off the phone with him. He's like, great. Attorney Want anything in writing? Cohen. Email me. Attorney Cohen. I think I think we're gonna continue with the hearing. Okay, if you want to, I'm leaving. If you want you, to, no, if we'll you just want we'll to, just appeal it. Meantime, this will take. I will make this take in three years. From your client and confirm, then the board will consider continuing the hearing. We would have to take a vote to continue that. Okay. However, we we opened the hearing. We're gonna proceed with the hearing. If you want to work on putting something in writing by your client that you can transmit electronically, otherwise we're proceeding with the she's hearing. Right there. Take her, put her under oath. She's right there. She's in this. Oh. She's six boxes down and three, yeah. three down and three to the right. They, put her they under don't oath care, though. <laughs> and have her comply. She'll, she'll do it right in front of everybody. Instead of emailing two people, we can just tell everybody right here with their right hand up. I'm not sure that you're hearing what I'm saying, Attorney Cohen. No, you're not hearing so what I'm saying. Logically, she's right there. We're she's going right to there. proceed with the hearing. She's right we're going there. to take the testimony of individuals that have appeared. You well, can take that's a, illegal. You, my, okay, my you know what? Too, this is North Reading. You're not dealing with Boston dog lawyers. Little North Reading is dealing with Boston dog lawyers. I, but I, you can I also have the there. opportunity yeah, to get that in writing over to the DA. Mr. You make it stuff up, Mr. Gilberto, because that. Mr. Gil, thank you, Mr. Gilberto. Okay. <laughs> um, sorry, Mr. Chief Murphy, I think you were all finished with your comments, and I believe I was in the middle of reviewing what recommendations were made. So I'm going to go through that again, and then we're going to proceed with testimony from the complainants who are here. The recommendations from the uh, dog officer include the following, ordering both dogs to be confined to the owner's premises, both dogs to be humanely restrained to an inanimate object when outside. When either dog is removed from the premises, they shall be muzzled and restrained with a tethering device with a minimum tensile strength of 300 pounds and not to exceed three feet in length in that the guides who are the owners maintain at least $100,000 in liability insurance. And as we know, if there, these attempts fail, the other recommendation that was made to the select board was to order the dogs, both dogs to be euthanized with which the officer concurred. So Chief Murphy, before we take the testimony of the individual complainants who are present, what, do you have anything else that you want us to consider? No, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Gilberto, am I missing anything in terms of the documentation that was presented to the owners as well as us in the packet? I don't believe so. I believe you've identified all of them, Madam Chair. Okay. So we have at least 13 complainants whose complaints were provided to the owner. So I would invite um, any of you that wish to speak to come forward, we do have your written statements, but I do see many of you are in attendance. If you would just raise your hand, um, Mr. Gilberto will, um, will be able to, to unmute you to participate. I can see you waving if you would Identify your name and address for the record prior to speaking. My name is uh, Daniel Coveney. I live at 5 Winterberry Lane, not threading. And Mr. Coveney, you are actually the individual that wrote the initial complaint that was bit by one of the two dogs, correct? Yes. I, I, my dog was attacked as I was walking her on Juniper Road on a leash. Okay, so we have, we did hear of that um, statement that was provided and Chief Murphy explained what had occurred. Is there anything else that you want the board to know about in this hearing? I just, you know, wanted to let 
you know that I was just, well, again, just casually walking, and it's not even on Maple Road, Maple Street. And the dogs, the first one of them came and just simply came upon her and went right for her neck, bit her. And then the second one started doing the same thing. And, you know, uh, me, I couldn't even get them off the dog, my dog. Uh, I was on the ground with them wrestling them, uh, you know, trying to get them off. You know, it was hard. Eventually, I called to help, and the, yes, Stansbury's helped out. Eventually, you know, they were dragging her all over the place. I mean, these dogs are just simply there to kill somebody, kill another dog, really. Um, and, you know, and um, if it was someone else, it would have been a lot worse, I think. My dog is, you know, a golden retriever. She's got thick skin. That's what the uh, fire uh, people said that, um, you know, if it wasn't for her thick skin, she probably wouldn't have survived. Uh, or it would have been a lot worse, whatever. But, you know, to have one, but the second one was just, was way too much. And, you know, I was trying to get her off. I was trying to hit the dogs and they still wouldn't release, release her at all. And I, it's, and we have a lot of people walk in that area. You know, I have, we have neighbors that have young children, you know, teenagers that are walking that dog with littler dogs. And if those dogs were, and that was just actually walking them that day. And if it was just a different timing, God knows what would have happened to their dog because they wouldn't have been able to uh, defend them off. But if it wasn't for the Stansberries, you know, I don't know if I could have got those dogs off. So. Okay. And so the dogs came after you and your dogs when you were They came home. after the dogs, my, my dog directly. They didn't even, you know, uh, check her out or anything like that. They just simply attacked her. I probably got bitten as I was trying to wrestle with the dogs to get them off mine. And Mr. Coveney, did the dogs bite your dog? Oh yeah, oh yeah. There was considerable um, markings on, on her from the front to the back. And luckily they didn't get to the vet said that if they went for the front, there would have, it would have been a lot more damage. It would have been fatal. It would have been fatal. Okay. okay. Do, do the, my colleagues have any questions for Mr. Coveney? Mr. Walner? Yeah, just, uh, did you encounter, uh, you know, vet bills? Um, you must have brought your dog to the vet afterwards. Did you have, expenses related to this yes i did okay. i have not billed you know i have not sent anything over to them i just want to my first priority is, is is taking care of, you know not having this happen to me or to anyone else again right understood thank you and, and i i also have you know had a, i went to the uh, to the clinic the winchester clinic to have my hand checked out so they said they wouldn't put stitches in because of a dog bite, they don't generally put stitches on a, uh, a bite, but it, it was cut that, that badly. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from my colleagues? Seeing none, Attorney Cohen, do you have any questions of this complainant? Your, can, Mr. Gilberto, could you unmute Attorney Cohen? Uh, have you supplied any documentation about the um, scope of the bites to your dog? Any pictures, any vet bills? Yes, all that was, I, I submitted all that. Pictures. The pictures and the dog bite, uh, the vet bills. Okay, so um, right now I am sending to the board the statement of compliance it is signed by my client. I'll send it to Mr. Gilberto since his is the email that I have. And Attorney Cohen, if you would just explain to the people that are here in attendance, what, what's the statement of compliance? Sure. Now that I'm calmer, I'm happy to do it. I have to advocate for my client. 
So when we got notice of the hearing, um, we needed to get all the records. You just heard from the um, person giving testimony. I haven't seen them yet. So the statement of compliance is what I was asked um, to have my client confirm that my client would agree to, which I did, but now it's in writing. If Mr. Gilberto acknowledges receiving it, that uh, they signed the statement that Eddie signed the statement that said, I will continue to um, whatever the order that was in place on 1231 20 remains in order in, in force, uh, three foot leash, muzzle order until at least until the hearing that's being held on February 8th, which I have the notice that, in the Zoom instructions for the February 8th hearing. Everybody should get their chance to be heard. But my clients got to, we, we got to be able to know when they're, when they're going to speak and when we're going to hear them in order to put on a, a, a fair defense. So um, that's why I was told the hearing's not happening tonight. So we're certainly not ready to go forward. Can somebody acknowledge having received the statement of compliance? Matt, Chair? Yes. I have received just now an email from Attorney Cohen. Um, that is signed. Um, I, I cannot, I can't read the signature. Um, so Attorney Cohen, you're going to have to tell, tell us who signed it, but I, I, there is a signature on the bottom of it. It's signed by Eddie Guy. That first letter is an E. Oh, I see it. Yep. Okay. And so it says, I, I, I'm Madam Chair, if you'd like, I, I read it. If you'd like. Sure. It says, I, Edward Guy, of 18 Maple Road in North Reading, to agree to continue to use a three foot leash and a muzzle when outdoors with either of my two dogs. This safeguard will remain in place until a dangerous dog hearing is held, which is scheduled for April uh, for February 8th, 2021. February 8th, 2021. Signed, uh, Edward Guide, January 11th, 2021. So, okay. So just so that everyone understands and also that you understand, it, Colin, Attorney Cohen, we have to advocate for our citizens and our citizens' dogs too, because you're talking to a panel of colleagues who love their dogs just like they love their children. They're parts of our part of our family. So, but we don't deal with this on an emotional basis. We deal with this on a factual basis. And we have a number of residents that have appeared. So while we appreciate your advocacy, we were needing something in writing in order to take a vote to continue the hearing. And I don't even think at this point the board had determined what the continuation date was, although it appears to be incorporated into uh, this by way of a request, I suppose. So, so although we've opened the public hearing, I'm gonna turn it back to my colleagues at this point to take their position on whether or not we can grant this continuance and um, based on the receipt this evening by Mr. Guy, the owner of the dogs, and based on his attorney's representation during this public hearing, that they will comply with those orders that have been in place for safety's sake um, until such time as we hold the public hearing and make a determination. So um, Mr. O'Leary, let, let, I'd just like to know what is your pleasure with regard to, to voting on a continuance of this hearing? Uh, my question is, and I, I saw uh, some correspondence from Attorney Cohen requesting some information from the from the town. Have you received that uh, information that you requested uh, Out, just... outside of excuse me, outside of the uh, whatever you're going to ask for under the Freedom of Information Act? But have you received other correspondence in the reports? I just want to check my um, <clears throat> email. So here's I have a letter. Actually, that's my letter. I have um, this report to the chief. There's, I have some of the complaints and then um, there's copies in, th in three citations. Uh, so it looks like information is coming in. Um, I just, my goal is just that we get to the right decision the right way. It could be, you know, sometimes dogs have to be removed. I get that. But even though I have some of the information, knowing that the hearing was put off till February 8th, I haven't had a time. To first, of all, okay. first of all, I just wanted to make sure that what you requested on behalf of your client 
was complied with and given to you. I mean, my guess is you probably have everything that I have in front okay. of me as a member of the board. Um, secondarily, as far as um, some previous comments in relation to, you know, you understand what was going to happen in North Reading. Uh, I've been sitting in this board since 1988. And uh, I don't recall anybody not getting a fair hearing on anything. Um, so I, I don't know what you were inferring. Uh, thirdly, um, I live in very close proximity and, and know a lot of these people and neighbors and dogs. Actually, I know some more of the dogs than I do the neighbors sometimes, I think. <laughs> I know the dogs' names instead of the, yes. the neighbors' names. Um, you know, so this is of, of grave concern. The, the dogs are known to the, to the area, known to the police department. Um, but I certainly want to make sure that, uh, that Eddie and his wife get, get a fair hearing. And again, I don't, don't know that it was an unreasonable request that you made because I understand you have a conflict on the 25th as his attorney and you would request that the 8th town administrator happened to convey to me a couple of days ago that that was the request and that the concern was we just needed to know and have in writing that Mr. Guide was willing to comply with the current regulations uh, that are in place or the restraints that were in place and we hadn't received anything and there was nobody present at 8.15 when we opened the hearing. So. You know, that being said, I, you know, I, I'm not looking to inconvenience all these people that are here, but by the same token, you, Mr. Guide deserves a fair hearing, just so long as he's in compliance, the dogs are restrained. The question I have to Chief Murphy is, how can we be assured, and are, is there going to be a checkup on a daily basis or a regular basis in the neighborhood that the dogs are restrained appropriately? Because we need to, we need to know that that's going to take place. Otherwise, What's the sense of continuing the hearing? Let's just make a determination. Again, I want to give a fair hearing, but I also want to make sure, and, and now we have it in writing, that Mr. Guide's looking to comply. Now we have some responsibility to ensure that that compliance is, is met. So I, my question to the chief is, how can we and will we? Madam Chair. Chief, please. So I did check with the animal control officer. He has received no complaints um, of any violations since the order was issued, um, the muzzle order. Um, but it's it's also difficult because it, you know if the dogs aren't outside then we're not going to see the dogs. So he does drive by you know to check on it, but he has never seen the dogs outside when he's patrolling. So I mean we do rely on you know people to call us if they do see it, um, but we continue to patrol as well to check. You know, but we're also relying on the owners to to do the right thing at this point as well. Okay, thank you, Chief Murphy. Mr. O'Leary, any other questions? Nope. All right. Just to, to take a quick, just kind of to take the pulse on where you're at, would you be based on the written acknowledgement by Mr. Guide and Attorney Cohen, would you be in agreement that we could vote on a continuance of this? I would be at this point. Okay. Uh, Mr. Walner, any questions? Uh, just, I see that somebody wrote on the chat that in fact they have seen the dog without a muzzle since the uh, since the compliance order was in place. So I'm I'm in favor of getting this done tonight because I think it's a huge safety issue that needs to be addressed right away. Okay. Um, I think we'd have to, um, I think we'd have to defer back to Chief Murphy. So if there is a violation of the muzzle order, um, what isn't this the next step for that, Chief Murphy? What do we have available by way of um, what the dog officer can do by if he observes the dogs without the muzzle outside in violation of the order? Yeah, so we would come back in front of the board at that point. I don't know that our recommendations would be the same if there are violations of the muzzle order. And I just, you know, we do have, I know that people may be concerned about, you know, providing the name and a complaint. We do have an anonymous tip line. If, the, you know, if somebody does see the dogs unmuzzled and, and we'll have an officer up to check on it right away. So just for peace of mind for people that may be concerned about calling. Okay. Um, so Mrs. Gonzalez, any questions? And I just want your, um, opinion on whether or not we should be moving to continue the hearing based on the receipt of the written agreement of the um, owner as well as the attorney's presence here in indicating there'd be compliance. 
You're muted. So first I would like to just say um, thank you, Mr. O'Leary for laying out, you know, why the hearing started and that I take offense to the statement made that this was typical of North Reading and that we don't like them. I'm, I don't even know them. Um, and I, I'd just like to state that, that, that I took offense to that statement. Um, and I'd also like to know, um, Chief Murphy, if, they, if the dogs are running free or unmuzzled um, before our next meeting, I mean, what is the consequence of that? Where do we stand with that if that happens? So we, we would, you know, we have bylaws and in, in general laws in place. We would just continue to follow that. You know, I think multiple violations aren't going to change. Um, you know, unfortunately, if, if, if there is, the dogs do bite, um, you know, I think the animal control officer or a police officer does have authority, you know, beyond, um, you know, fining and, and, and issuing orders um, if it's a public safety issue. Um, but short of that, we would be right back here where we are. So, but they would continue to be uh, fine, but if they're out and about running around unleashed uh, and off the property too, the animal control officer would, would have to. Correct. Yeah, he would, he would, he would I... issue violations for being unleashed, unrestrained. Um, but as far as the muzzle order goes, there's the, the remedy is to come before the board. Because okay. the, the muzzle order is only a temporary order right. in order to get before the board. And then the board can issue whatever um, orders they deem necessary at that point. And that would be permanent. And I would assume that there would be um, part, of, part of the board's decision, obviously implemented as part of the board's decision. Chief Murphy, I think we lost you, but um, Mrs. Gonzalez, are you in, um, uh, I just wanna, before we proceed, because we may be calling for a vote to continue this hearing to a different date. If these are, terms are complied with as the owner has sent to Mr. Gilberto and as attorney Cohen has explained, are you in favor of um, granting a continuance of this hearing? I, I'm going to have to say that I'm, I'm very concerned uh, after reading the statements from all of these residents that live around there. I don't live far from there myself and walk my dog. I've had dogs my whole life. Um, I'm concerned and I don't want to see another dog hurt and I don't want to see, God forbid, a person hurt. Um, I, I think I would want to proceed if it's, if it's lawful and we can do that. I'd like to proceed. I, the owner is here here. I mean, she was on here. I don't, the information is available to the attorney and to everyone. I, I, I would be in favor of proceeding. Well, I think, and I don't want to speak for, I won't speak for attorney Cohen. However, he did indicate that he is awaiting mm. additional documentation from the town. So and I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Gilberto. I know he received, the owner at least received the letter, um, as well as the copies of the complaints. Have you received any other requests for documentation in order to um, uh, allow the attorney and the owner to be prepared for this hearing? Uh, there, there was, Madam Chair, through you, a public records request that was filed, I believe on Thursday, seeking the associated documents um, with this. Um, my, our response would likely be the very packet that was given to the owner of the property um, and provided to the select board this evening. Uh, it's possible that there may be some internal emails that we would have to identify from our electronic mail system here in the town hall. We've not provided those to uh, Attorney Song, but I, I can tell you that uh, you know the, the information at the subject of the hearing obviously is all in the hands of the owner and I believe was also forwarded to Attorney um, Solomon by the police chief, if I remember correctly. Madam Chair. Yes, Chief Murphy. So all the documents that were requested by Mr. Cohn were returned the same day to him. So he has all the documents that he requested from the police department. And I believe 
the town clerk also fulfilled her public records request. Okay. So does that, Mrs. Gonzalez, you you want to move forward? Is that, I'm just trying to get your impression. Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Studo, your thoughts on? Um, so the only thing I look at it from is a standpoint of as long as everything has been provided to Mr. Cohen and that there is not some appeal that we end up losing if there, I don't know where you appeal this again. I mean, I'll maybe somebody can educate me on that just because I think then that will become an incredible waste of time for everyone involved. But if he has all the facts and that needs to be confirmed, because I do agree with Mr. O'Leary that, you know, it's, um, everyone needs to be operating with the same set of, you know, facts and information to make it fair, you know, just because the worst thing is when the losing size is not fair, as we know. So what I want to say is that I would, if we can get confirmation tonight, and that's a bit, and that's the problem, like real confirmation, um, and that everything has been received, then yes, I think we should move forward. However, if there's any chance that some document has not arrived, and that then can leave the door open for, well, the select board, you know, voted in haste, or were predetermined, that's my fear. So that's the only thing. And, uh, and also I would add that if there was an agreement with the town attorney, um, that, that's my bigger thing too, is that, you know, a, our word is our bond. So um, I, you know, again, I, I wanna proceed, but my fear is that I, I, do, I do need the confirmation that all documents were received and that there wasn't some oversight between the town attorney who cannot speak on his behalf right now because he's not here and Mr. Cohen, because the worst thing would be to then find out after the fact that, well, there was an expectation that this didn't have to be received till tomorrow, which we can't get confirmation. That's a big question that that would solve, that would help me a lot. So, and I, I don't think we can call him right now. No, and it's it's pretty clear Attorney Cohen is waiting on additional documents, whether or not they're related, he has made the request for them and the town has a certain amount of business days to respond to that. And I'm assuming that, you know, because it was just recently sent that they're gonna do their due diligence in responding to a public records request, despite, you know, the receipt of the notice and the, the complaint. So there were other things that Attorney Cohen has asked for. Mr. Gilberto, I noticed your hand up, but you see the struggle that we're in that it, it seems pretty apparent attorney Cohen seemed to have an arrangement. We did expect written a written confirmation, which is typical in these public hearings when a request is made by an individual that that individual put the request in writing. And we uh, have this added factor of the dog um, being the do the dangerous dog issue being a requirement that the owners agree that you know while those orders are about to expire that they're going to be extended to a continued date so what i understand was sent to mr gilberto and because we're in this meeting i haven't looked at it was that owner's agreement to comply with those terms until the continued date which i think mr gilberto also confirmed so mr gilberto is there anything else you wanted to add to that I would just add that, um, you know, based on the conversations, as I understand them between town council and attorney uh, Cohen, the intention was that um, the, the hearing would have been continued administratively, and we would have notified all parties that there was an agreement that this took place, but it was conditioned upon receiving written confirmation. When that confirmation was not received by the time the agenda for this meeting needed to be posted on Thursday afternoon, this hearing was posted. Um, and Madam Chair, I know you and I discussed that uh, as well on, on Thursday, uh, which is what has led us to where we are at this evening. Um, it has now subsequently been provided by, um, by Attorney Cohen um, this uh, attestation of this willingness to comply, and that does fulfill the expectation, as I understand them, the conversations between the two attorneys going back to Thursday of last week. In terms of the request for the records, 
Um, you know, again, um, you know, this is one where the, the meeting packet contains the records that are relevant to the hearing. They have been provided to the, uh, the, to the owner. I believe they've also been provided, although secondhand, to Attorney Cohen. Um, the only other records I could think that might be out there might be electronic communication um, related to this. I don't believe that they're substantive, but I don't want to represent to the board that we've done that complete search and provided those to them because that was not ultimately the intention when we were at the point of um, discussing the hearing on Thursday. Okay. Okay. So we need to make a decision and move either move forward or take a motion to continue it with the certifications of the written confirmation from the order now received. Mr. O'Leary, I see you're waving at me there. I am. I also just want to make something very clear, and I'm sure this isn't Attorney Cohen's first, first hearing before a local board. Um, town council advises us, does not speak for us. This board determines when the board, when the hearing will be continued to, and, uh, and it, uh, obviously in consultation with the with the uh, with yourself, yourself. But but again, uh, this board would determine, you know, when when the hearing is going to be. The town council cannot agree to a date on behalf of the board. The board makes that determination. And again, you know, to me, this is not, uh, you know, well, well, I have no problem listening to everybody tonight and come to some, some reasonable conclusion on it. Uh, I just don't want to see us get into an appeal situation, wasting a, additional uh, taxpayers' money on appeals, uh, prolonging the, uh, the determination that this board will be making uh, just because of some technicality at this particular point in time. I don't think it's wise. So if we can wait to, until the future date that the board finally determines uh, to make it happen, I think it's in everybody's best interest. Again, I'm not the least bit concerned about making a determination, listening and making a determination. I'm quite prepared to do that, but um, I don't want to. I don't want to get hung up on technicalities and have this thing prolonged unnecessarily and have everybody spend an inordinate amount of money when we can come to a conclusion at a reasonable time period. Okay. Okay. So, do we have a motion? Uh, yes, Madam Madam Chair. Oh, I'm sorry. I did not see you. I apologize, Mr. Gilberto. He didn't have my hand up. That's why. <laughs> but uh, there was a hand up from uh, a member of the audience here that I believe um, Mr. Sutherland at one point had his hand up, but I do not see him on here now. Okay. Um, okay. I see. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> He's right there, uh, um, Madam Chair. Uh, hi, this is uh, Tim Sutherland, 17 Maple Road. Sorry, I apologize. There's, not, there's a message in the chat room. This is virtual hearings at its finest. There's a long message, but I think that's from you, Attorney Cohen. Uh, yeah, it is. you could skip it. It just says, oh. it's just showing that in this message, there wasn't anything. He just, it's, you can see how it's worded. I did get a subsequent one, but it just says he's complied with it, so we're not asking for much. Just showing that Initially, it wasn't a requirement that it be in writing. Okay, so it is saying essentially that he's saying that in view of the serious nature of the document to dog attacks, the continuance is conditioned on Mr. Guide's agreement to continue to abide by the animal controls leash and muzzle order issued December 31st, which you just sent. You sent that a little right. while ago, signed by Mr. Guide. But to that day, I did, in that day though, I spoke to Guide, spoke to Riley. I said, I'll call him right now. And he said, yes, of course I'll comply. So okay. thank you. So now we have just, and while you're here and in attendance, we did have someone who had raised a hand to speak and I apologize, Mrs. is it Mr. Sutherland? Yeah, Tim Sutherland, 17 Maple Road. Sorry, please, go ahead. Um, just concerned from the comments uh, made tonight, uh, during the quarantine period, so I live across the street. So never once were the dogs muzzled. I wasn't aware actually for the first half of the quarantine that there was a quarantine. Um, and then I also wasn't aware that you could call and it would make any bit of difference. So I didn't bother calling. Um, but, you know, secondly today, you know, knowing the hearing was today, the dogs were out at least three times. I work from home, I sit in the window. Um, they were not muzzled once today. And once was like at 6.30 tonight. So I, I, I can't, I, I didn't really want to get involved, but at this point, like if we're gonna, if we're gonna do this, dogs have to be muzzled. Yes, and I see the Stansberries have their hands up as well. Uh, Mrs. Stansberry. 
please, um, if Mr. Gilberto, could you unmute? And if you could just identify yourself by name and address for the record. And you, Mr. Gilberto, they're muted. One second. I, I, I've unmuted them, Madam Chair, and I now I'm prompting them to unmute. They may be able to say yes. yes. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Mrs. Uh, Bernie, Bernie and Charlene Stansberry, 18 Juniper Road. Um, I, I, I don't want to give a bit long statement now if this is if we're going to continue this hearing, but what I really want you all to take away from the statement that we put into the police was my husband jumped in that haunts me and there was three adults trying to pull these dogs off of a 90 pound dog and they didn't had no response to any of us. They did not, they, 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 they and they, it was three attacks, not one. It was three separate attacks. And after we finally got the dog into my house, they're still trying to get into the house to attack the dogs. So they are vicious and they are only out to attack other dogs when they are off leash. And I'm sorry to the guides, they're, probably lovely dogs in their home, but they are vicious attack dogs that are not properly socialized. And so if you're gonna continue this, somebody or some way, those dogs need to be muzzled at all times. And, and, and that's where we're at because 15 minutes after this attack, there were two teenagers walking a 15 pound dog in the same exact spot. We all know what's gonna happen. What are we waiting for? And that's the problem, right? Thank you. Thank and this isn't the first attack. Also, this there was another attack that didn't get to the police, but they they it's all ever there's several people on here that know about it. Okay. This isn't the first. Okay. So I mean attorney Khan, you see the issue here now. Two neighbors are saying that they're not even muzzled when they're out in the yard. So you you see that you see the issue of with you know, what the board's grappling with here. And although we, we typically do extend the courtesy once we receive the requisite documentation, you see the issue that's here. So please, if you don't, if you don't mind, to get, I know you have your hand up now too. No, it's fine. I, I wasn't sure if you wanted me to comment to that. I, yes. I, oh. yeah, I, I, oh, think, okay. I think that, that despite the letter, I think there's really, it seems pretty clear that, that, that they're not complying already, so. If there's something you can else you can offer by way of an assurance. I don't know that the written assurance is going to cut it here. So, well, I certainly don't want to um, put myself out there for somebody who's not going to if you comply. Um, obviously, I, I just got the case recently. From what I'm hearing from everybody, I, I wouldn't want this person as my neighbor under the circumstances right now with the way the dogs are managed. So I need to figure out if he can manage them better or not. Um, so in terms of other stuff to do, well, I think, I don't know what North, if North Reading has a kennel or whatever, but I, you do have the, you could, if, if these dogs are violating before the next hearing, and that's a, that's a risk. I, so if they're caught again, if there's a verifiable, you know, non-compliance, now everybody knows what, what the rules are. Um, I think you have to seize them at his cost and put them in a kennel until the hearing. Um, that There's got to be a consequence to, to affording us the ability to put on a fair hearing. I mean, that's, that's great, but it butts up against people's safety. So I get that. So I think that if he's not compliant and we have a credible proof, I mean, everybody walks around with a way to capture this. Well, then, then I think that penalty has to put in. It all it has to be put in. It also wouldn't help him when I'm trying to put on a defense here that I'm trying to say here we have a, a, an owner who can be better tomorrow than he is today. But if he's not going to follow what we what I fought for tonight, well, then that would put the board in a situation of saying, how can we trust this guy again? So. Uh, I only want to re represent responsible pet owners, and I know a lot of the ones I represent were irresponsible, but it's my job to see if I can get them, get them there. But um, I wouldn't tolerate this either if, if there was a violation of, um, of the safety measures put in. So 
And, and what I would say is, um, and that's, those are seized at his cost, you know, until the hearing, that's whatever the cost to the town, he has to reimburse them if he doesn't win. Okay, so I think, oh my word, um, I think we have to, it's, it's 10 past nine, I think we have to decide whether we're moving forward or not. I, I understand what you're saying, Attorney Cohen, and I understand the request for continuance, but it sounds to me like even in place with these current orders and not being complied with, and obviously that's our number one priority is safety of the other individuals and, and animals. But Mr. O'Leary, one last time. Hopefully, <laughs> for the last time. But and again, I, I appreciate uh, Mr. Sutherland's comments. I mean, I was unaware of it. Um, and to Attorney Cohen, you know, I appreciate your comments, but you know, at his expense, you know, put the dogs in you know quarantine or lock them up somewhere. Uh, but my question would be, at who else's expense? And who was other dogs' expense? Um, yeah. Right. Exactly. You know, and it was at whose expense? You know, it was saying, okay, you know, yeah, again, I I've been here trying to advocate a little bit for you know, give me a little bit of wiggle room here to come back and, and provide a defense and give us the full um, airing of, of what you know their particular side of the story is here and and I understand there's been some health issues there with, with Mr. Guide and all the rest I'm well aware of that but you know that being said it still doesn't excuse necessarily what's what's occurred um, but if they're not complying as recently as tonight that's problematic <laughs> that's problematic yeah and I appreciate your empathy uh, as to the situation we're in here. And what know, if we do so at whose risk and who, who's, who's other animals risk and whose person's risk? And, and the Stansberries are, are kidding. I mean, people walk their dogs by that street every single day, multiple times a day. And uh, some of these dogs are, would, would be a snack for these, these two animals. So it's, well, we're all in a it's tough a huge, You're asking us to take a huge risk. Well, I would put it this way. If, if the hearing had been tonight and you came up with the worst of the worst other than euthanizing the dogs, you'd probably put in a muzzle order and a three-foot leash. I mean, the, aside from ordering a fence, that's probably the strictest thing you can do. Um, and then a violation of an order has all the consequences of it. I'm softening because I'm a human being, but what about this? Since everybody's here, it doesn't, it doesn't solve everyone's problem, but w since they're here, let them speak, but you don't vote tonight. You continue the hearing. So I get my chance because I, I haven't, see, I haven't prepared anything. So I don't know who's going to say what I haven't had a chance to go through anything. So my concern is, I mean, I got to advocate for, Whatever's happened, he's got a right to a fair hearing. And a fair hearing means adequate notice. And I was told it wasn't until February 8th. So even though I have a lot of this stuff, with three other hearings this week, this was not on my radar over the weekend. Can you clear your schedule and allow it? And uh, maybe we can accommodate you at a sooner date. Okay. So we were told the February date because you had a conflict. Yeah, but, and I thought you just meet uh, on certain, yeah, let's do that if we can find a date, sure. Sometimes, yeah, but but if you the board wants to suggest some dates that are sooner. Well, the, we, we have regularly scheduled meeting in, in a couple of weeks. That's, that's what we're regularly scheduled. When's that? 25th. I know. Uh, so that, that's, that was the conflict date for me. That's why I, we moved to the eighth. Can you clear um, your conflict? This one I can't because that person doesn't have their dog. <laughs> They've gone 30 days with the dogs in quarantine. So I can't get rid of that one because their dog's locked up. Attorney Cohen, are you scheduled for a specific time and we can work around a time with um, you on that one? That's a 6 p.m. Well, I mean, you didn't start this one till what, 8.15? 8.15. 
Well, technically today we started it right at eight, which is unusual for us, but we could mark it for you at 830 if that works for your schedule. Okay. Uh, knowing that I can go into that, that hearing and say, look, I've blocked two and a half hours. That should be enough time. So, okay. I could do the 25th at 830. Okay. And I'll speak for my client that he could do. But again, in the interim, I, I do think it's a, a, a huge concern for us. They're not even muzzled when they're under orders to be muzzled. So when, when I get off this meeting, um, you can imagine the conversation that I'm going to have with them. Yes. I, I would just hope that you wouldn't put a muzzle on when you're talking. <laughs> <to them. laughs> and, uh, I, and I apologize for getting a little out of line, but I, it's important to me that a fair hearing and sorry for offending North Reading, but um, not every town does it right. So appreciate you giving me the time. Okay, thank you, Attorney Cohen. All right, so I, I know that there, we're joined by many people who want to speak on this issue. And so if it's the intent of the board to grant the continuance, we'd be coming back, we'd be, um, we've opened the public hearing and then we'd be continuing this again to the 25th, if that's the pleasure of the board. Um, to be heard again at 8.30 on the 25th, which is our next regularly scheduled meeting. And um, I'd just like to um, hear from the board. What's your pleasure? <laughs> What's your pleasure with regard to this? I know we're all struggling. So, and now we even have attorney Colin struggling clearly because of what the residents have told us. So. Mr. Walner. Hey, can I just ask from a legal point of view, um, you know, the, the point that uh, Mr. Sudo brought, brought up, if we continue tonight, are we putting ourselves in jeopardy to do something more in the future? Or you mean from, from, from our legal position? Yeah, from a legal position. I mean, I, I personally wouldn't debate a legal position in, in, uh, in front of the uh, opposing party's attorney, but nevertheless, our legal position is protect the residents, protect the residents' animals. Um, that's a pretty well-traveled area. So from a legal position, we're doing our due diligence to see to it that this public safety issue is um, taken care of. Era. From a legal perspective, I would have a difference of opinion with Attorney Cohn, though I'm not the board's attorney. I no, think no, that no. It, it was a noticed hearing. I, I, I understand there was some back and forth, but an Attorney Cohn isn't familiar with our process where we actually vote to continue on the floor. We just did that. Uh, you know, we not only do we vote the dates of public hearings, but we vote on continuances on the floor. And I think unfortunately we didn't have the documentation that we asked for so uh from a legal perspective i i'm not uh, you know one way or the other it's up to the board whether or not to do this if the board feels that the safeguards are in place but also that all of the residents attending need to alert us if they see one dog out without a muzzle then that and the attorney attorney Collins right the, the animal officer is going to go and seize the dog and that'll be the end of the story. And it's just our issue, Attorney Cohen, with is that dog going to do damage and harm people or other animals in the meantime? That's our issue. We don't want to wait till that happens. So, um, you know, we're going to go back in circles until we make a decision. And I think it's time for the board. Right. Now, we've talked about this for an hour and 15 minutes, and I think it's time for the board to make a decision on, on whether or not we're going to move forward. Yeah. Um, well, that'll be first out. I, I think we should continue hearing tonight and sell it. Yes. And I also think we do have people here and Attorney Cohen is here with us and, and, and we can go along with that suggestion to let these people speak and then continue the hearing until Attorney Cohen can come back. However, we'd want those people to return with, you know, to that continued public hearing if that's the board's pleasure to do to handle things this way. And Attorney Gilberto, was our attorney planning on attending? Uh, we had not arranged for town council to attend, all, although again, the, the discussion was okay. about a potential continued date upon receiving the documentation, so. So, notice and the opportunity to be heard is what due process requires. And the notice is there 
He has counsel stepping forward in our notice letter to this individual. We invited him and his counsel to attend. His counsel clearly was under the impression this would be continued. We still have to take a vote on that. His client has since that point provided us with written agreement, but it's clear to us that his client doesn't really understand those terms and conditions. We have attorney Cohen here representing that he will make sure that his client understands those terms and conditions. And we have also the chief explaining to our residents, whatever you see that's in violation of those terms and conditions, and we'll read them again. We need to be alerted right away so that someone in our law enforcement can take action, mobilize and take action, which would be to seize the dogs at the owner's expense. Um, so I don't know if there's anything more to add to that, but if we want to proceed and hear from the people that are here, I think we need to make a decision to move forward on that. And then we can then give, a, give an opportunity to return to this for a final decision. Okay, and what's the board's pleasure? Mr. Walner, Mr. Studo? Uh, okay, uh, yeah, why don't we, um, for the sake of going, instead of going in a circle and not leaving any stone unturned, um, you know, we can, as long as the neighbors, and I know it's a big ass, but if everyone can watch what's going on like a hawk at this point, and maybe we can get the animal control person to randomly do some surprise like inspections, which I don't think is too much to ask. Uh, knowing that the dogs would be taken away and that this board would probably not be too happy about it. And, that, and I know Mr. Cohen wouldn't either. I guess I, I, I can agree to a continuance just to make sure that we do it once and that doesn't come back to this board for any technicality as Mr. O'Leary mentioned. Okay, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. O'Leary, your, your thought? Uh, I'm good for the 25th and make a move if you have to in between. Okay, Mrs. Gonzalez. I'm, I'm fine with the 25th on the condition that I do understand this correctly, that if a neighbor calls the police and says that these dogs are not muzzled or tied, that the animal control can seize the animal and lock this animal the, or these animals up at the owner's expense until the hearing. Is that how I'm understanding this? I think that was attorney Collins representation. Uh, just that it would be a cr credible, that it's verifiable, that there's some other proof just beyond the person saying it. So to prevent what, could become a mess. I understand, but but if if there's a phone call made and the animal control officer or the police officers respond and they see that themselves. Yeah, I mean that's that, proof. That legally we we have the right to seize the dogs and lock the mm -hmm. dogs up until the hearing. Is this is that correct? Chief um, Murphy, and maybe I'm uh, gonna refer to you. Um, Madam Chair, I'm not aware of anything that gives us the authority to seize the dog, unless that dog at that point in time is a public safety risk. I mean, we can assume that it's a public safety risk at this point. Mm -hmm. However, um, we look at it as the dog is attacking a person and or another dog, which we don't want to be in that position. So, you know, when, when Attorney Cohen talked about what he was talking about, I'm not so sure he was referring to if the dog was just outside being not muzzled. So our authority is to bring the dog owner before this board if they violate the muzzle order. So just Madam Chair as well, we had made, I, I see somebody made a, um, a comment about removing the dogs. We had made that suggestion um, right from the get go with the guides. They were actually working on um, relocating the dogs. Um, and at some point they, they just stopped cooperating with us and, um, and that's why we brought them to the hearing. So I'm not sure that would be possible if, unless the attorney agrees to it. Madam Chair, I think if we have a, a complaint from a neighbor to the police department, 
that the dogs are not in compliance with what they've agreed to, to restrain the dogs with muzzles and the appropriate chains, I guess. Um, to me, I would not be adverse to an emergency meeting of the Board of Selectmen to, to, to reconvene and make a determination. Pretty darn quick, quickly. But hopefully we don't have to do that. You know, hopefully the, the owners will comply. Uh, appreciate the opportunity that they may be provided here. And um, then we'll adjudicate it on the 25th. Chief Murphy, do, do I under, did I understand you correctly? Let me just clarify that if Attorney Cohen agreed to that situation happening, that if the dogs were unmuzzled or untied and the police or the animal control came and saw that, that with his blessing, the dogs could be taken? Well, I'm reading the bylaw right now. The violation of a muzzle or is a $25 fine. There's not much teeth in, in that. I, I, I think we're I think we're a little beyond that at this point. Yeah. We've opened a public hearing and we have we have a number of complaints now. We have an individual that told us he and his dog were bitten. So I think what I think we're, we're continuing it to give attorney Cohen the opportunity to see the records that he's asked for and the other information that he's asked for, if that's what the board wants to do. There is, there is no doubt that if the owner is, is disregarding those orders, then our, we have to give our residents much more assurance than we're just gonna give a $25 fine. That makes no sense. So we're, we're here and we, we may have only imposed this order or else, but we need to have some assurance beyond just a random surprise check, a regular check by the animal control officer until our hearing. And if they're not in compliance, we have, we're, we're gonna to have to seize the dogs and put them in a kennel. We, we don't have any other option unless we move forward with this hearing. The owner and the owner's attorney are requesting a continuance so these are the terms that we should be imposing the continuance if that's what the board wants to do. But we need to do this. We need to make a decision and move forward one way or the other. So if we're going to grant the continuance, we, you know, we're 15 minutes more. If we're going to do that, let's impose the conditions. Although I would like to hear from the residents at this point, we're doing them a disservice continuing to talk about this when they're here to speak um, because we're having a difficult time trying to decide this. So attorney Cohen's here. I, I think we should just hear from the residents and let's, let's move forward. I, I don't think we have a consensus here in terms of, um, you know, I don't think I don't think I have a, a majority here in terms of continuing it. I would certainly be in favor of that, provided that we give these people the opportunity to speak, and then give Attorney Cohen the opportunity to come back with the defense. However, we we have to continue it on those terms and conditions, and and let Attorney Cohen impart his, uh, you know, strenuous explanation to his client as to what's going to happen if he doesn't comply, and then. We, we need to hear from the residents to say that there's non-compliance. I think that's really important for us. Mrs. Gonzalez, did you have your hand raised? No, no. Okay, all right. So um, if I could just offer the board, I'm just gonna offer the board, let's hear from the residents that are here and, um, and we'll, it, you know, they're here to speak. We, let's, let's at least proceed with hearing from the individuals that are here to speak. Um, and then, these, Madam Chair, will these individuals also be asked again to re speak again at the next meeting, or could they defer tonight? And in other words, if someone speaks tonight, are they going to be allowed to speak again at the next meeting? It may be redundant, but but generally, people like to do things hearing all in one night. And once, yes, once. You know, I understand that, but. You know, we, we, we opened this hearing at eight and now we're, we're going back and forth on whether or not we're gonna grant a continuance. So I think we're doing a disservice to the people that are sitting here waiting to be heard. Um, so if, the, if it's the board, I, I do think we have, I, I can't, I don't hear that we have a consensus on continuance, so. Mr. Um, raised. Yes, Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, through you, uh, just a, a question to Attorney Cohen. 
you had sent a, a written request for a continuance of the hearing. Um, you had asked for a two-week period, um, and you identified that you were going to be submitting public record requests for documentation. So I, I first, through you, Madam Chair, if it's okay, I'd like to ask whether those public records requests have been submitted, and to your knowledge, have they all been replied to? Uh, so I've submitted my public records requests. I've received uh, responses to them, but I can tell you that um, I haven't looked at them because there was an agreement that the hearing was going to be on February 8th. So I have, by not having any type of foundation and anticipating what some of the folks here tonight might say, I've been unable to prepare um, for what I would want to ask them through the board. And I've been un I haven't been given the opportunity to even have my investigator uh, dig into any of that. I mean, and but more so, we we have paperwork to submit. You know, we have um, uh, evidence to submit too for the board to consider. And um, and while I'm here, Mr. Guide's not here because we relied on fact that the hearing was going to be on February 8th. So he, he may be, be able to pick up on something that someone says that I, I wouldn't even know about uh, if there was some prior fights between dogs or something like that. So, um, so I, I don't have reason to think that my requests weren't, weren't complied with, but there's another request out there, which is to have a mirror file you know, so whatever the board has in front of them, we have in front of them. My, I haven't heard, I mean, my assumption is that it's, that my file looks like yours, but that's something that doesn't really come out until the hearing. Okay. Madam Chair. Um, uh, uh, Mr. O'Leary. I would be concerned uh, for the residents, neighbors here who are gonna be offering testimony to offer it up this evening to provide uh, because that normally wouldn't be the circumstance uh, to provide um, Mr. Guide's attorney an opportunity to, to hear it all and then try and refute, have his investigator investigate the comments that are being offered at a public hearing, um, which would not normally be the case. I think that would be an unfair advantage uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to Mr. Guide and, and unfair to the residents in the neighborhood. So, I mean, people are more than welcome to speak, but just be aware that, you know, the opposing attorney is, is sitting here taking notes and gotta go back, speak with the other uh, people and confer. And as Attorney Cohen said, you know, they would be asking questions of these people who made these statements. The statements have been made in writing. Uh, mm -hmm. He has everything that we have. And then if people are gonna offer public comment, you know, let it be more spontaneous rather than, um, two weeks lag time to think about it, investigate it and come back and refute it. I think that would put everybody at a disadvantage. I wouldn't advise speaking. Okay. All right. Um, and I think the statements say what they say. I don't think it's gonna be any different. I think what we're gonna have is new evidence such as what we heard tonight that even despite the orders they're on muzzle. So I don't think anything new is gonna arise between now and then that's gonna be very helpful too the guides clearly, um, unless we can let their attorney, you know, uh, get in, get it, get them to understand the seriousness of this. So, so I understand where you're coming from, Mr. O'Leary. I understand where you're coming from, Attorney Cohen. I do think we need to give our residents uh, some assurances. I appreciate the assurances Attorney Cohen has given us that as soon as he gets off of this meeting, he's gonna be right there talking to his clients, which it's baffling to me why they left, but that's okay. So um, do I have a, an and for the residents that are here, we are hopeful that you will return if the board does move to continue this to the 25th. We want you to come back to that 830 hearing. We want you to be heard. Um, and that is the context of this if we do actually continue this. We do have your written statements and we'll certainly can read those into the record, but we want, we want you to be heard in the context of this public hearing. So um, in that context, is there a motion from the board with regard to continuing. 
Madam Chair, am I adding the conditions to the motion? Uh, absolutely. Okay, so bear with me then. Without a doubt, absolutely. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to continue the nuisance, the dangerous dog hearing regarding dogs at 18 Maple Road to Monday, February 8, 2021 at 8 p.m. No, January 25th. At 8.30 p.m. At 8.30. Attorney Cohen has, is, has agreed to move that up. He had a conflict, but we're, we're oh, okay. To run Excuse me. Okay. Shouldn't have read it. So at 18 Maple Road to Monday, January 25th at 8 30. 30. Thank you. With the conditions that the dogs be muzzled and all other uh, conditions of the public safety director be met and stipulation that dogs are removed if not. And attorney, uh, just Mr. Studo, uh, Mr. Gilberto, if you could recite those conditions that by after your recitation will incorporate into this motion. Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> Madam Chair, through you, the conditions were to uh, continue to use a three foot leash and a muzzle when outdoors with either of the two dogs. And I'm gonna ask to you, Madam Chair, the police chief, did I miss any conditions in that statement? No, that was part of the order on December 31st. Okay, so I have a motion with those conditions by Mr. Studo. Do I have a second? Second. Motion, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Walner. No. Manu Pelli is no. So the motion carries. You will, we will ask the residents if you would please come back for the for the continued hearing on the 25th at 8.30. We know Attorney Cohen will be here. We know the guides will be here. We will ask the residents if you observe any violations of these conditions to please call or, or alert us, alert the police right away. If you, even if you take a picture of it and send it to us, we would appreciate that. Um, and also ask you to um, just keep us aware. We would ask Chief Murphy on behalf of the residents to please make sure that the animal control officer in this circumstance, we need on high alert and regularly, regularly patrolling to ensure compliance. And if there is no compliance, move forward with seizing those dogs until we have that uh, continued hearing, public hearing on the 25th. And, okay, so Miss Mrs. Gonzalez has, has her hand raised. The deliberation is over. <laughs> I have no. Mrs. Gonzalez. I just wanted to ask Chief Murphy um, if maybe, I, I think that there was a an app or a, or a um, a phone number that could be called anonymously. Is that correct, Chief? Yes, they, they, uh, anybody could um, go to our website at um, www.nrpd.org and you could submit a tip right through there. Um, it's, it's not monitored overnight 24 seven, um, but we, you know, we do have people that monitor it and we will, the, the best way to do is just call and, and you, can, you can call anonymously. Um, you don't have to give your name if you call. Great. Thank you, Chief. And I don't think, I think we have everybody here. Their names are on. I don't think they're concerned about anyone knowing who they are. I think we're more concerned about people's safety. And I think, Attorney Cohen, you understand that too. And you're talking to a panel of people that are dog lovers, but that we're also, you know, safety lovers too. So we know you are, and we want to make sure that your client it does everything to comply and is considerate of the fact that a continuance was granted. So step it up and make sure that there's 
full compliance with those requirements. So, and we appreciate your showing up and hanging in here. And we understand the issue, but we will, you know, move forward with this on the 25th with you when you get there at 830. Thank you for hearing me over my own noise. Appreciate it. I've been emailing with him and I'm calling him right now. Thank you, Attorney Collins. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you for uh, Attorney Cohen for the guides for the residents of the neighborhood. Uh, the meeting on the 25th will be another virtual meeting. Uh, it will be hosted uh, most likely on the same platform and also broadcast on uh, NORCAM um, on cable television. And the Zoom login information is anticipated to be posted on the town's website um, roughly the Thursday before the hearing. Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. Okay. So our next order of business is the um, vote to accept the donations from the International Family Church. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, through you. We have with us this evening, I, I believe we still have with us, uh, Pastor Jonathan Del Turco from the um, International Family Church. Uh, Pastor Del Turco, are you still there? I know I saw you a few moments ago. Oh, I guess not. She may have departed in the meeting this evening. Uh, well, I know you <laughs> wanted him to be here. Should we pass over this, um, Mr. Goldberg? Back on. Yeah, just go to the next agenda item. <laughs> <laughs> if he pops back on, we'll. Hollywood. Maybe he'll come back. Uh, is that John? Is John? Can you unmute him? He may have actually fallen asleep. Who knows? We're not the most entertaining board. <laughs> I did just ask him to unmute if that is in fact him. I don't know that it is though. Okay. John is with the dog hearing. We're leaving. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Sorry. Thanks for your time. We were hoping. We appreciate your attending and we, we hope you come back. All right, okay, let's move on. Uh, Mr. Gilberto, is that time sensitive for us to vote to accept it? I'm sure we need the money, but I know you wanted to really have the pastor here so that we could acknowledge and you know say a few I words. I, I did. It's, a, it's, a, it's a great moment for the community, I think. And um, I'm, I'm just gonna confirm with the police chief, but I, I don't believe it's, there's any reason it couldn't wait until our next meeting, um, Chief Murphy, is that correct? That's correct. There's no issue. Thank you. Right. And thank you, Chief. Okay, so let's we'll we'll table that one till the next meeting. Make sure it's definitely before 830. All right. So our next order of business is to discuss the June 2021 town meeting. It is already something we need to think about. It's upon us planning. I feel like, I feel like we're halfway there tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, it is uh, on the agenda really for purposes of us just sort of identifying that it's on the horizon. Um, you will see in the packet that I have notified departments, boards, and commissions of the due date for warrant articles to be included on the warrants. But I have stipulated that the extent of the warrant and the venue of the town meeting itself are contingent upon the public health uh, emergency and the state of uh, our ability to um, host the meeting in particular uh, venue. Most of the board members may be aware that historically we've uh, been required to have a hearing in January to schedule the June town meeting date. However, with some charter revisions that were approved by the town going back a few years now, we um, now are able to have that hearing uh, anytime up through March 31st. So at the moment, it's my recommendation for us to sit tight, if you will, um, decline to hold that hearing until we know more about the sort of state of um, public health and our ability to have uh, a meeting. Um, most of the gathering limitations do not apply to a legislative body such as town meeting, but we're obviously trying to be mindful of them from a standpoint of planning for uh, um, public health purposes. So our expectation would be to come back to the board um, at some point, uh, probably in February with an update to talk about the planning and the discussions and probably look to have that hearing to set the, the town meeting dates in March um, when we have more information. So you uh, just want us to keep it in mind and remind us we have another town meeting coming up. So we have a time meeting and, and more so for the general public that there is a deadline. It's the third Monday in, um, in March. 
at 4 o'clock p.m., particularly for those who may be interested in submitting citizen petitions. Um, that is your deadline for the uh, for the June uh, town meeting. And so Perfect. I just uh, seek to make uh, make everybody aware of that. Perfect. Okay, thank you. Any questions? All right. Next order of business is to, uh, oh, appointments, Veterans Event Committee and Cultural Council. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Go. Due to an oversight, I neglected to include the citizen activity forms in the original uh, main meeting packet. So they have been uploaded separately for the, I believe, four candidates in the share file meeting folder um, for this evening's meeting. That occurred late this evening, I believe. Do you have those, Mr. Studo? Yeah, the motions or the... The names are the same. It's just the backup information for the candidates that we uploaded separately. Separately, okay. Uh, I think I, I think I got them all, but hold on here. Okay. Let me go just, I, I'm on the share file now, so I might as well just. I have three screens going on once and I still don't ever have all the information I need. So I don't, I don't you know what? You're awake with a newborn. That's a feat in and of itself. I think I already played my sympathy card on that one too many times. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm just never enough sympathy for that. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Studo, I believe that the motions themselves are in the customary location with the um, with the meeting packet. Um, I, starting on page five, I believe. Okay. In the main meeting packet, what we added was just the um, actual applications themselves. Oh. So it's page eight, the motions. I was going to say it's not. Yeah. So, okay. Okay. Yes, because I have the separate ones that I get from uh, <clears throat> from Jane. And Jane, I believe those are the same motions that were included in the main meeting packet. Is that yep. correct? Yeah, and we're just changing what again? I'm sorry. Nothing. We're not changing. Oh, no anything. changes. We just added the backup information. Okay. Page eight at the bottom. I think it's time. Yeah, I don't know why I'm so. I I have it here. I'm just having issue getting it up opened. Okay. Oh, I see. Okay. So just added the backup information. Why am I so confused? Mm, okay. So read them as is, or what am I read them? Okay. They can be read as is. Yep. Okay. Madam Chair, I move to place a nomination of the following names for appointment as associate members to the Veterans Event Committee for a term to expire November 6, 2023. Dan Mahoney, Michelle Reed. A second. I okay. Um, miss, miss <laughs> we have a um, motion. And by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any, uh, Mrs. Gonzalez is the liaison? Yes. Is it two for two, Mrs. Gonzalez? Yes. Um, yes. As, oh, it's associate members, actually, I'm sorry. It's the associate members. They were two spots available for associate members. Okay. Um, Happy to say that there was a lot of interest in this committee um, and happy to be appointing these two people. Great, so a motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. So who's the chair of the committee? So, so I was gonna talk about that because there is a full membership. So I was gonna address that then, but um, Joe Vino was the chair um, and he, has chosen to um, step down. So there was no vice chair. So I had to confer with Sue Magner, um, you know, to go through all the applications. And so her and I came to 
we decided this together, seeing that there was no chair or vice chair. So they will reorg once the committee gets filled. So motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. It's a name vote. Mr. O'Leary. Dan Mahoney, Michelle Reed. Mr. Studo. Dan Mahoney, Michelle Reed. Mr. Walner. Dan Mahoney, Michelle Reed. Mrs. Gonzalez. Dan Mahoney and Michelle Reed. And Manu Pelli is Dan Mahoney and Michelle Reed. Um, Mr. Studo, if you just go back to page eight at the bottom, that's the full mem that's the um, motion for the the full member appointment to the Veterans Event Committee. Okay. Um, you keep saying page eight, but I, I don't know why I'm getting confused. It's on the left the side. Motion right before that one. The motion just before the one you made would be the, for the full member. Right above it. Yeah. It's actually okay. page four, but on page the, four. So that's what yeah. I okay. Right. Oh, mine's page eight. Yeah. On the on the actual paper, it's page four. Yeah, that's what I was going. So that's what oh, just that, okay. so that whole five minutes of me thinking <laughs> I'm losing my mind with that. Because I'm looking here and page eight, and I'm like, I'm I'm losing it. So at that point I just started reading whatever was in front of me. Yeah, eight is four. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Madam Chair. On page four, <laughs> I move to place in nomination the following name for appointment as a full member to the Barron Event Committee for a term to expire November 6, 2023. Andrew Lee. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Mrs. Gonzalez. Andrew Lee. Well, I <laughs> oh, you want me to comment? It's one for one. I don't know if you need to comment. <laughs> But I'm just offering it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, we're, we're thrilled to um, appoint Andrew Lee. He's a graduate of West Point. He's um, very excited to get um, involved in this committee and we're looking forward to him. Excellent. Okay, so we'll take a name vote on the motion. Mr. O'Leary. Andrew Lee. Mr. Studo. Andrew Lee. Mr. Walner. Andrew Lee. Mrs. Gonzalez. Andrew Lee. Emmanuel Pelli is Andrew Lee. And, okay. and we need to thank Mr. Vino so he didn't seek reappointment. Is thank you very much, Mr. O'Leary. I would love to thank Mr. Vino for his participation in this committee and all that he's done. He's been involved <sighs> in many, many things, um, and he, he's he's not finding the time to do this and has you know, chosen to hand it over to someone else that he felt could um, give more time and to it. So we do thank him. Okay. All right. Um, and the next is for cultural council, Mr. Strudo. Yes. Madam Chair, I, I move to place a nomination the following names for appointment to the cultural council for terms to expire December 31st, 2023. Erin Matt Daniels. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. And I know it's one for one, but Mr. Waller, any com and you want any comments as a liaison? <laughs> uh, he has plenty of room. Phil's actually, you know, the chair, he's right here saying get involved. But uh, uh, no, he has up to 22 slots. I think he's at nine right now. Um, he's already interviewed her and it's all sounding very good. So um, it's a it's a go. Great. Okay. And uh, it's a roll call vote. Mr. O'Leary. Aaron Matt Daniels. Mr. Studo. Aaron Matt Daniels. Mr. Walner. Aaron Matt Daniels. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aaron Matt Daniels. And Manu Pelli is Aaron Matt Daniels. Okay. Next order of business is uh, approving conflict of interest exemption, Mass General Law, Chapter 268A, Section 20D. Vote to approve, vote to authorize the chair to sign. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and this, um, this matter is before us as a result of uh, an attempt to provide some limited programming by the Parks and Recreation Department uh, over the summer, uh, last summer, summer of 2020, 
as I think the board, and I'm sure that, as I'm sure the board, and I think the community is aware, there were any number of restrictions in place um, over the course of the summer with regard to our ability to offer recreational programming. And um, the Parks and Recreation Department entered into discussions with a recreation committee member who is affiliated with a larger um, recreation uh, organization to provide um, a, a series of uh, clinics uh, for uh, youth over the summer, over the course of, I believe, three weeks in August of 2020. And so it was identified that in order to ensure that uh, we are meeting the letter of the uh, conflict of interest law, there would need to be an exemption approved in order for um, payment to be made for the services that were provided by um, the individual um, who's involved, who again um, happens to also be a, uh, a volunteer on the recreation committee member. Um, I think this was a well-intended approach taken by the Parks and Recreation Department to provide programming when there were not many avenues available to offer programming and when many of the traditional organizations that would offer youth programming were not doing so, this individual, Billy Luker, stepped forward and was willing to do so. So I'm asking, um, along with the Parks and Recreation Department, that the board uh, approve the motion that's been provided to authorize the chair to sign um, this form as uh, an exemption. It would be one time in nature to allow us to pay an invoice that is pending going back to April, of, uh, excuse me, to August of 2020 in the amount of approximately $3,000 for services that were rendered. Moving forward, um, I anticipate that there'll be some discussion amongst Parks and Recreation, myself, um, to identify what resources might be out there um, so that uh, we can potentially um, not need to uh, enter into this type of an arrangement with a recreation committee member again. Um, but um, you know, if there is a need at that point in time, it would come back to the board for review in advance of the programming being offered. And we have provided a motion, uh, Madam, Blair, Madam Chair. Are there any questions um, in regard to this from the members? No, none, okay. Do we have a motion? Madam Chair, I move to approve the conflict of interest exemption for Billy Luker to authorize the chair to sign the exemption form and to authorize the town administrator to facilitate payment of outstanding invoices. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. Um, you've, we did the vote to authorize me to sign already. So our, I think our next order of business is to discuss the meeting schedule. That is correct, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me, I believe in November, uh, we discussed um, setting the series of meeting dates that would take us through to the end of um, February, um, excuse me, to the end of January. And so we are proposing uh, meeting dates intended to take us uh, through to the um, Monday um, immediately after the May 4th election. Um, and the dates proposed were in February, February 8th and 22nd, um, as well as February 27th, which would be a Saturday for the traditional police department, fire department and Department of Public Works budget hearing which generally is a day long or a nearly day long event. Um, so we have identified that date and we are working, as you know, Madam Chair and Madam Vice Chair from the, our discussions and financial planning team to have the budgets ready in time for that timeline to be met. And I'll talk more about the, the budget itself under the town administrator's report. We're then proposing actually three dates in March, March 1st, 15th and 29th. I think that depending upon the workload, there may be the opportunity for us to um, to uh, cancel one of those meeting dates, but at the moment um, we've identified them all there as uh, for scheduling purposes. What was those again? The third? The March, so it would be February 27th, which is a Saturday, and then March 1st, 15th, and 29th. 1st, 15th, okay. And 29th. And then we proposed April 12th, um, April 26th, and the intervening week is a so-called school vacation week for the Patriots Day holiday and then May 10th. April 12th and 26th, right? Yes. And, and then May, May 10th. 10th. So Gilberto, that's Saturday one, where this year I will not get to bring my mother's cookies. Why? Because we're not <laughs> gonna be together. 
<laughs> Unless I can uh, And you drop them off. You I mean, I guess I could do that. The mailboxes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you can socially distance and leave the cookies. <laughs> That's true, Steve. That's true. I mean, I, I'll. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can get I can get pretty set of precedence, Mr. Studo. <laughs> I mean, I can get pretty creative with those, but would we be doing that? So that'll just be a really long Zoom meeting, pretty much at that point. If assuming that there's no miracle that we're all vaccinated before then. I mean, that was my anticipation. Um, okay, this is the the likely size of folks. I don't think that we could comply with the gathering restrictions given how many people we normally have at those hearings just between the two committees that are meeting the this board, the finance committee, the departments that are involved. Um, obviously, as we get closer to it, if there's an opportunity to do that, I think we would all consider it, um, but I'm expecting it would be virtual at that point. Can, can you review those dates? I, I, do, did you mention the Saturday date in March? I'm sorry if you did. In, fe in February, February. It, it's only a Saturday date in February. 27th. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I have a mailbox, so feel free to drop off the cookies at 57. <laughs> <laughs> Special deliveries, right? Okay. Um, all right. Are there any other any comments, questions? That looks it's looking to be. Can you would you, Mr. Gilberto, just circulate that those those dates around to us just to sure. and add them to our calendars? Sure. All right. Um, the next uh, item is legal bills. Vote to approve legal bills. Madam Chair, I move to approve legal bills for November 2020 in the amount of 13,475.27, general 5366.27, labor 2476.50, 20 Elm Street 2632.50, arbitrator. B. Fraser, 3,000. Total, 13, 475, 27. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Strudel, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And Manny Pelli is aye. Okay, we're on to the town administrator's report. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'll try to move quickly. Police Chief Michael Murphy became president of the Northeastern Massachusetts Law Enforcement Council effective January 1st. Chief Murphy has been on the executive board of NEMLEC for a few years and was assisted in the transition late last year, um, 2020, 2019, excuse me, uh, when the previous uh, president was required to step down after changing jobs to a police department outside of the NEMLEC region. For those who don't know, the Northeastern Massachusetts Law Enforcement Council, or NEMLEC, is a consortium of police departments in Middlesex and Essex counties and two, sheriff, uh, count, sheriff, two county sheriff's departments. The member agencies operate by sharing resources and personnel, collectively providing services to each other that might not be available to one. NEMLEC coordinates the sharing of personnel and resources to provide <clears throat> member agencies with the ability to provide supplemental services to the 1.7 million people in the 925 square miles that they serve. And congratulations to Chief Murphy and we thank him for stepping into that role. The State Department of Revenue approved the town's fiscal year 2021 tax rate of $15.63 per thousand dollars of valuation. On December 17th, 2020, real estate tax bills due February 1st were recently mailed. As is the case each year, the January bill reflects the first bill for which the current year, fiscal year 2021, is um, reflected and therefore incorporates any associated change in valuation and change in the tax rate. Um, I'd like to remind all residents that information regarding real estate exemptions, which is an ability to reduce your tax obligation if you qualify, or abatements, which is an ability to contest the valuation of your home, the classification of your property, uh, or similar matters. That information is available on the town website. Um, there are some deadlines that are important to consider um, for abatements, which is a, generally the value of your property. You need to apply by February 1st, and for exemptions, you need to apply by April 1st. The 2021 open burning season kicks off this Friday, January 15th. Residents can begin applying for permits today by creating an account on the fire department's new burn for, for, uh, portal. 
northreading.firepermits.com. This is a streamlined software separate from Permit Eyes, which provides the online access to construction related permitting. And I included a copy of a media release that's been put out by the fire department. And then finally, I also included for the board members a copy of the first iteration of the fiscal year 2022 revenue and expense plan, which was reviewed at the most recent financial planning team meeting. Um, you'll see um, we have information in there um, as sort of a starting point. Uh, one thing that I will note is we have carried forward a customary transfer from the capital improvement stabilization fund um, of uh, roughly one point um, one million dollars, excuse me, in the planning process of this. This is something that we've that's been identified during the course of budget uh, discussions over the, uh, the a number of the past few years, and um, it's something that we've accounted for in here as sort of the starting point. And we eagerly await additional information from the state regarding projections for uh, local aid for fiscal year 2022. Um, know it's a lot of information and it's late, but uh, I did provide that for the board more just to keep you informed as we continue to make, to, to make our way forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Gilberto. Any questions? Uh, just a couple of comments and questions. Uh, one, uh, the burning season thing, the, the permit, piece of cake. I did it the other day. I think it took me less than 30 seconds to, to do it. And that's certainly going to be, work pretty well because that way you're not going to be calling the, the fire department and tying up the lines or anything else. And it's very simple, very easy. And I would encourage people to do it and would start burning on the 15th. But really, it took, took less than a minute to, to apply for it and be into the system. So it, it worked extraordinarily well. Uh, the other thing was, I think most of us probably got some correspondence from a local taxpayer asking about the tax bill and why it went up so much. And I know the town administrator responded to that individual, but I also had some other comments from people similarly. And this time of year, when these bills go out, we get a lot of the same comments. Like, you know, my tax bill jumped to inordinately in a significant amount of money and how come, what's going on? You're not doing a good job. Um, maybe if you could just clarify for everybody, Mr. Gilberto, again, as to, you know, this current quarter is a makeup quarter because when we reset the tax rate, there's basically a, a makeup. And particularly for those people whose homes are in the middle assessed valuation, um, they may have seen an increase in the assessed valuation, whereas the higher end homes remain stagnant. And middle, middle of homes, uh, assessed valuation went up. So therefore you have an increase in the, in the assessed valuation, the taxes are gonna go up. And then when you combine that with the makeup of uh, the adjustment, it re results in a higher tax bill for this particular quarter, but maybe you know, you're I think that was, to the other person, but. I think that was well said, um, you know, we, the, the way our budget works is it gets carried, you know, the, the rate increase for the fiscal year we're in does not get reflected until the January, the, the bill due the end of January. And uh, that is exactly what happened here. I mean, for all of our residents, um, our budgeting is done, you know, in the interest of balancing the needs of the community with the resources that are available. Um, our budget is developed within the parameters established under Proposition Two and a Half, which governs the uh, ability to increase property taxes. And um, you know, the I think many of you have been in the conversations on the financial planning team or on the finance committee, and you are aware of the challenges we face each year. And um, you know, this year was no no different. It was in fact more complicated uh, than previous years. Um, we're hopeful that we are with our a balanced budget. We have a, a bit of a head start on fiscal year 2022, which is um, forecast to be very challenging. And we're hoping that we'll be able to sustain services at the level um, that we've had to reduce them to at this point, at least moving forward. And if we have the ability to restore services, um, we will. You know, to the issue of property values, and I, I know we've talked in front of the board multiple times in, in tax classification hearings. Um, some of our you know, lower to middle valuation properties here in town are the ones that have seen the most significant increase in values as the properties turn over with individuals um, looking to buy into a community. Um, and uh, those houses, uh, there has continued to be upward pressure on the values of those homes, those four or five, $600,000 um, homes even, um, more so than the changes that we've seen on, on the upper end in some cases. And, I think that what we've heard, you know, at least from a resident and from other, from, from one resident writing, but from others, I think verbally, you know, that that, that trend has continued uh, and it's a reflection in, in some ways of a hot real estate market, not only this past year, but for in North Reading the past three or four years. 
and then in relation to the uh, one of the other questions was in relation to the Pulte money, you know, yeah. why are we, you know, rebating it to people? And, and again, we're restricted as to what we can do if we just want to clarify again. That, that's correct. I mean, we know that, that there is sort of a belief that the town has received this, you know, windfall, which it has, but state law does not allow us to use it for recurring, um, recurring expenses so it's to be dedicated for capital purposes um, and, and that service. And, you know, we have been handling it in, in that fashion. Okay. Any other questions? Madam Chair? Oh, Mr. Gilberto. I have a question for myself. Forget something. <laughs> you forget something in your report. Right? No, but uh, I know we're heading into old and new business. And um, one thing that, and I just, I don't want to forget to say this, but we will need to vote a new time for the hearing for Lucky Mark as a result of the vote earlier this evening on the dog hearing. That's not an issue. I think we'll just change the time because I've obviously not notified them over the course of this. Okay. I forgot all about that. What time did we originally vote to hear it? I believe we said 8.15. And I, I think with this hearing, with the dog hearing being at 8.30, probably back it up to 7.45, um, you know, uh, or maybe 8 o'clock if you think a half hour is enough. Probably need to do 7.45 on that one. I suspect so. It took us a long time to decide what we were going to do with the continuance. Um, so I would say 7.45, if not 7.30. Is that is, what's the consensus of my colleagues? And this is for which one? Lucky Mark. Lucky Mark. They're, they're, the violation. Uh, I'm sorry, you, you broke up. I didn't. Like the, we where we rescheduled, oh no, we scheduled the show cause hearing for Lucky Mark for the same evening. I It slipped my mind that we, we scheduled for 8.15. So, and uh, we'll definitely need to push that back a little bit. So I would give. I would say 7.30. It'll be a discussion, I would think. Yes, yeah, okay. So mm -hmm. do, do we have, I have a motion to schedule that Lucky March show cause hearing for 7.30 p.m. on January 25th. So moved. <laughs> so, <laughs> motion by Mr. O'Leary. Do I have a second? Second. Second, second by Mr. Studel. Let's give Mr. Studel the second for one. It's all right. Any further discussion seeing that? Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studel. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Ms. Manupelli is aye. All right, so that one will, Lucky Mart will be 7.30, followed by the dog hearing at 8.30, all right? Okay, now, anything else, Mr. Gilberto? No. So we're, now we're on to, we put old and new business and board member reports back to back. So um, we, let's, let's um, take old and new business. Do you have anything, uh, Mr. Studo? Should I do both or just all the new business? Yeah, just do all the new business. We'll get to board member reports. We'll do it in order. Anything, any all the new business? No, I just have the board member reports. All right. Mr. Walner, any all the new business? Um, I would just ask, uh, now that you're involved with the, um, the Facilities Master Planning Commission, if you have any word yet when they might be meeting and getting started again, um, just because I'm recognizing that as I sit in on the CPC meetings and hear more about the water and sewer, probably coming up at the October town meeting, there'll be warrants related to each of those efforts. And so um, it, it, if we don't have information from the facilities master planning commission committee, then you know we're gonna be missing, the town's gonna be missing out on some very valuable information. So I'm just wondering if you have enough. Yeah. Their, I think their charge, just to answer your question, their charge was pretty specific in terms of what the what the review was going to be and which buildings. However, because of COVID, you know, it's understandable that they um, they were, you know, the you know, individual wasn't able to get into the sites. However, we are, I believe, convening a meeting January. Mr. Gilberta, you're going to have to help me out with that. The, we are ha holding a hearing this month for a uh, uh, very limited in scope. 
to, to address the fire department um, building, right, Mr. Gilberto? Yes, I believe the intention of the chair was to have a meeting on Thursday afternoon. Is that correct? Um, I think I heard at 4.30. I'm not sure whether it's been posted yet. Right, right. I think it was tr trying to get a, get the um, in to, to make sure everybody was available for that. So, but I think as soon as the COVID-19, um, hopefully we'll have some improvements of that and then, you know, be able to have people in site, on site, inspecting sites, et cetera, to be able to finish up the work of that, that particular committee. Um, anything else for old and new business, Mr. O'Leary? A uh, couple of things. One was, uh, I was wondering if the administration had an opportunity to do a, a, a post-mortem on the election and, uh, you know, what we had to go through this past year, really the whole half a year anyway, three elections, um, as far as the mail-in ballots, as far as early voting. Um, and I know that the, the state budget allows for municipalities to uh, continue on with the practices, you know, through March 31st, but our election isn't until May. And I don't anticipate that um, most people are going to be vaccinated and moving about freely in time for our town election. And, and I just think, uh, from my vantage point, I thought it went very well, at least the mail-in portion. We may not need early voting you know, for the town election, but I think the mail-in portion of it would be uh, behoove us to gear up for it, uh, maybe ask the legislature for uh, to extend the date. Maybe they'll do it to June 30th and maybe they'll do it on their own anyway. But, but to me, you know, I, I think the way that the elections were held this past year are probably what we're looking at moving forward anyway. Um, but that being said, we have our town election in the spring. Uh, it, it can't be normal, <laughs> you know, and I think we as a board need to, need to address the situation and give some guidance um, to the administration and look for some advice from them, but also, you know, look to the state to assist us in, in moving forward. I don't think there's a need to move the date like we did last year because we've tried the systems out now. Um, but to me, I think we need, I mean, it's, it's June 11th, or January 11th now. Um, nomination papers are gonna be available shortly, within a week or two, I would think. I think that's what it usually is. Filing deadline is gonna be March and before you know it, May is gonna be here. Um, so, you know, what are we going to be offering for guidance and what's our wishes moving forward for the town election? You know, to me, I think the, the mail-in ballots um, will be critical, you know, for participation. And the whole idea is to get people the opportunity to participate, participate safely. So, um, again, it, we haven't heard anything back yet as far as, you know, how things went, you know, with the three elections that were held, the June town election, and then uh, the primary and the, the final in November. I don't know what the, the feelings are for the rest of the members of the board, but to me, it's not too soon to be talking about it and, and seeking some guidance as to how we're going to do it in May. Um, I don't know if you've heard anything from the state on that, Mr. Gilberto. I haven't seen anything by way of expanding that to local, but I don't know if you've seen anything. Yeah, so the, the, the budget, the budget proposal pushed it out to March 31st for municipalities. But that doesn't do us any good. Right. Yeah. That's my understanding as well. And that would be for um, mail in voting only, not for in person early voting. That's my understanding. Okay. Oh, Miss, Mr. Studo? Uh, yeah, just, just one point to maybe, I mean, I, and again, it's not, uh, it's more like in general, I, I think, to whether or not things get extended. But it seems that, and again, I was on a, a non, you know, non-lawyer call. This was just in general, nationally, when things will open and what will get extended, you know, because of the economy. But I know that, I don't know if this will factor in, but um, depending on the vaccination schedule, based on the opinions I heard on this call late last week, the a lot of these things that were able to happen, like, you know, under the precursor of the state of emergency, I think courts are starting to give uh, indications at the highest level, especially the Supreme Court, that 
I think the leash is going to get shorter for governors to do certain things without legislation. So I do agree with Mr. O'Leary that if this is a priority for us, we should we should say something now, because I do think that if we're not in the middle of a surge, and again, this is just my opinion, listening to an analysis, if we're not in the middle of a surge, I think that some of these executive orders are going to, I don't think in our state, based on my opinion of what I heard on that call and what I've heard from Governor Baker and public comments, I could see where you know, maybe we need to take more initiative if we want more of this mail-in voting or any of these other things that we got used to the last year to happen. So I, I don't think it should be, meaning I don't think they're going to be as automatic as some think, because I think that governors already are starting to think twice about doing the same things they did last year, and we're in the middle of the bigger surge. So that's just an opinion I wanted to give for the record. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe Mr. Gilberta, you can check. I, I would say to check with town council on that. And maybe they have a, I, I don't know what they would permit us to do, but Mr. O'Leary's point is well taken that we should probably be looking into it now and seeing what, what would be permissible and when and how, and you know, what's the cost factor associated with that for us as well. Um, and um I know we we we're not the only town with May elections, you know, mm. and, and June town meetings that we're dealing with. So it's June town meeting, June town meeting might be a little bit late only because you know most of them were in March April. We mm. changed ours to June. I think we we're one of the only ones, so that's late. Mm. And but May is uh, May can be sort of active. April, but March, April, May with the yeah. spring elections. Are, but most of the municipalities have their elections in the fall. So. Yeah. Um, but, it, but to me, we're outside the window with the with what the budget addressed. Uh, you know, we took care of the March dates, <coughs> April, May, April and May, uh, communities such as ourselves. And to me, I think if we can um, get a consensus right now to uh, contact our legislators and, and ask them to initiate a, a petition to, to move that date out to, to include our May date, that would be helpful. And then again, look for some guidance and assistance if we can get it. But even if we can't get it, if the costs are going to be a little bit more for the mailing, you know, that we should be able to just institute uh, what we did before, mm -hmm. even without the reimbursement levels, just because it's the right thing to do. Okay. So I think if we get a consensus and give the administrator some direction to talk to the appropriate people, the legislature, Secretary of State's office, and uh, anybody else he deems necessary, and send the consensus of the board along. Okay, are we in agreement with that? Mr. Studer, are you in agreement with that? Yes. Mr. Walner? Yes. Mr. Gonzalez? Yep. Me too. So that's something you think you might be able to work on, Mr. Gilberto? And yep. I mean, I'm happy to, to talk further with the town clerk. You know, I, I did you know, speak with her today with regard to um, you know, some of these issues, <clears throat> timelines that are associated with uh, with this, and you know, while we we have not done a you know a full you know debrief, you know, I think it is fair to say that there were a number of challenges that went along with um, the elections that took place last year. Um, you know, for good or for bad, I think that the numbers that we're talking about for a town election are generally much lower in terms of the turnout. So you know, maybe that it's much more manageable. Um, but uh, you know, I'll talk further with um, with her about about this. You know, I, I, I when, in my conversation, she did relate to me that we have this in um, by mail early voting available through March 31st, that there's a, a desire to try to extend that on the part of the Secretary of the Commonwealth, I believe, to bring it to June 30th. I think he's trying to lobby for that perspective. And then there's a, the governor who's looking to add the in-person early voting component to it through the March 31st timeline. And so that's sort of where, you know, the, the moving parts that are up in the air right now, none of which have been decided yet at this point. I know that you know the town clerk was a, a bit concerned about um, you know expanding in-person requirements because of the potential exposure that it creates for the, the, the uh, uh, election workforce, um, many of whom um, you know may qualify for um, you know the, the higher at risk categories. So uh, I think that was you know not a I think it was an apprehension that she had a concern that you know she would want to consider if we were talking about something in person in advance as well. So. Those were her sort of initial 
you know, <clears throat> from, from a conversation I had with her. Well, the fact remains, even though you have those challenges and concerns, we may still have to do what we did before, you know, where the timing is of everything. So we just should be prepared for it. And I think we should uh, embrace it and, and move forward and let the public know how it's going to, mm -hmm. how it's going to unfold if we can, you know. Okay. Cool. Thank you. I think the only other, Mrs. Gonzalez, any older new business? I, I haven't finished, Madam Chair. I still have a, oh. Okay. okay. I, have, I have another. Uh, uh, did we start off with you? I, I forgot. Well, you started off with uh, Vincenzo. He, he passed. Uh, I think. He passed. Um, the other thing, most of you are probably aware that, you know, there's going to be a transition in, in, in Washington. And traditionally, every four years, the incoming administration tries to do something, whether it be a day of service or, or any type of other activities. And what they're calling for uh, this year and it's something that a lot of communities are participating in, is it's called the, the theme of the inauguration is going to be American United. But what the uh, inauguration team is, is looking to do and in inviting all the uh, communities around the country to participate in is a memorial to uh, American lives that were lost through the uh -huh. pandemic. And they're going to be doing something, you know, in DC, but they're asking uh, communities around the country to join Washington and lighting up buildings. Um, and ringing church bells at 5.30 uh, in a national moment of unity and remembrance. Uh, I had a call from uh, a constituent today, uh, uh, Mr. Watson, uh, John Watson, who graciously for the last number of years has been um, the bell ringer for us at the, at the uh, third meeting house. You know, I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to listen to the chimes. When I was growing up, you used to hear them. The clock used to chime every hour. But, uh, hasn't worked for a long time, so it has to be done manually. He does it on Veterans Day. Uh, so he's one of the few people that we have uh, trained and familiar with the with the steeple at the um, third meeting house. And he called to say, you know, are we going to be participating and not threading in any way, shape or form? And we should. And why aren't we? And I said, well, well don't say we aren't doing anything yet. I said, you know, let me let me bring it up. And I approached the subject with the town administrator. Um, and he was just going to do a little research as to, you know, what could we light up and maybe get in touch with the local churches if any of them have church bells and maybe at 5.30 on the 19th, um, participate along with all the other communities across the country. And I just think it's a, a nice gesture, a good thing to uh, participate in. And, and again, it isn't necessarily anything where large crowds are going to congregate. So there's gonna be the social distancing aspect of it all. And yet at the same time, the community as a community can uh, participate in a moment of remembrance for those and all those lives lost uh, over the last year. Um, so I just was looking for a consensus again to, to participate, take up Mr. Watson on his up, offer. And he said, you know, find out, and he said, find out what the protocol is. I don't know if we have to ring the bell for everybody that was lost or everybody that was lost in the town. And I said, we can look into those types of things. And he mm -hmm. says, he'll stay up there and ring it as long as he has to, because he just thought it was a terrific idea. Wow. Okay. I don't um, know what, again, but I think we need to, Embrace it or, oh. or not. All right, let's see. Let's pull. How about Mr. Stewart? Are you in favor of that? Yeah, Mr. Walner? Ms. Gonzalez? Yeah. And me too. I think it's a great idea. Thanks for bringing it to our attention. Well, and, I, I thank yeah. Mr. Watson for, for ringing me up and yeah. rattling, ringing the bell. You know, so well, it's, maybe uh, we can, you know, I mean, I know it would be, it's, it doesn't sound, Electrically efficient, Mr. Gilberto, but <laughs> you can pick, pick one or two buildings or ask for one or two buildings or three maybe to be lit up at that time. Uh, you know, or maybe use the fire trucks in some sort for, yeah, for some sort of a simple, like that. And, uh, and again, reach out to the local clergy and ask them to participate. You want me to climb up in the gazebo and light my... <laughs> so the lights are still up there, aren't they? No, I took those down. Oh, okay. Well, that would be nice. Well, they could to... be different. Like they will, they can light it up though. Yeah, no, no. Would do that. That would be I did nice. it myself the other time. <laughs> I would envision the, the customary, you know, action of light. If, if we're going to do this, which sounds like we will, the customary action of lighting the gazebo, you know, with lights, you know, that is sort of the focal point, very visible in the center of town. Um, you know, if there's other opportunity to, you know, to highlight it in the center of town um, at that moment, because we probably would leave the lights on rather than just turn them on, turn them off for that brief period of time. We could certainly do that as well. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, Mr. O'Leary, I know we had spoken earlier. I, I had not 
talk to further about the opportunity to ring the bell, but it sounds like John knows better than anybody that that is an option. It just needs to be done manually. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, all set, Mr. O'Leary? Well, we haven't got to board member report, so. <laughs> yeah. uh, I mean, the, the only other thing I wanted to, to comment on under all the new businesses is that, um, you know, like every other uh, American this past week has been very, very disturbing, you know, as to, to, to what's occurred. And I'm going to try and remain nonpartisan. I mean, what, what we've had here, the attack on in, in D.C., uh, Sue and I were, were sitting watching, we're going to watch the proceedings of the, you know, it's still going to be a perfunctory thing of, you know, counting the electoral votes. And what unfolded in front of us was just stunning. It was like, how can this be happening? I mean, we were just sitting there silently, you know, how can this be happening here in the United States? And, you know, so, so obviously something went awry, you know, something, something's not right. And, and then as we're watching and we get all the reports later on, you know, we see you know, what had happened. I mean, five people you know, died and, um, you know, and I, and I thought of, you know, my son and, and your daughter, Mrs. Gonzalez, as far as police officers, you know, on duty there when police officer died. Um, and now we have threats across the nation between the 17th and the 20th, where every state in the, in the union is, is on notice by the federal government that, uh, you know, there's potentially harm going to be done in every, every state capital. Obviously, something's gone wrong here. And, you know, people say, you know, the this, this isn't us, this isn't the United States of America, this is what we're like. And, and when we saw what the reaction was to that crowd being able to basically walk into the Capitol building, uh, obviously there were breakdowns there. But you know, how those that group of people was treated as opposed to other groups of people isn't right. Um, as far as you know, it happening isn't right. You know, so, so what can we do you know, to, to assist here at the local level uh, to, to unwind some of this stuff. And uh, we, we need to take some responsibility and we need to hold those to who are responsible for inciting all this stuff responsible for it. And, you know, we, we would hope that there's gonna be investigations and all the rest at the, at the federal level as to, you know, what transpired and why and what triggered it and, you know, how come the capital wasn't protected. Uh, that's all important. But, you know, we here at the local level and as individuals need to hold our elected officials responsible for the actions that they take or don't take. And I, I just want to impart on people, you know, I was mortified. I, I would never expect it in my lifetime to witness what I witnessed. Okay, live television. It, it was disheartening, concerning, uh, uh, just unbelievable. You know, so... We need, to, we need to talk about it. We need to recognize that the people are not treated the same, things are not equal. Um, and while there are far more good people around than there are bad people, uh, a lot of these bad people have a significant impact on all the good people in this country. Here. And, and we have to take a step back, take a look and find out, you know, how could this have possibly happened? And it didn't happen overnight. This has been percolating for a long period of time, even decades. Um, you know, so I, I would hope that we would, you know, send a message to our um, state and even, but particularly the congressional delegation, uh, you know, they need to take some pause and take a look at it and form a bipartisan commission to, to see what's gone wrong with the different branches of government. Uh, why have the norms been skewed so much and, and blown up? And, you know, how can they take some corrective action and it's going to take legislative action and policy decisions and all the rest. But how can they take some corrective action to ensure that things aren't stretched beyond the pale and aren't stretched beyond the realm of the responsibility here? Um, and, to, and to me, it's got to come from the bottom up again. You know, as much as they legislate and they impact us, well, we need to impact what they do and how they think and, and what they need to look at and what they need to do and how they need to address it. And I think we just need to send a message somehow, whether it be individually or collectively as a board even, is, you know, listen, congressional delegation, you need to, to form a bipartisan group to see what's gone wrong here. And if we need to codify what society determines to be the norms, then go ahead and codify it in the law. You know, take a look at it and change it. And we just need them to take a look at it and do that. And we need to send the message up that it's their responsibility to do that for everybody.
Um, a democracy is being challenged. I mean, that, I never thought I would ever see that. And you have the entire Congress of the United States and the Vice President of the United States sitting in there under siege. You know, should never have happened. Should never have happened. So I'm open to suggestions, but to me, we need to send a message that they have a responsibility to address it on a bipartisan level and to codify the changes that need to be made so that it can't happen again. You know, whether it be the president, whether it be a rep or a senator or a congressman or anybody else, they have certain responsibilities uh, to uphold the constitutional law and, and the sanctity of, of, of this democracy. And uh, it got blown up. It's just absolutely bizarre. And uh, I think we should say something. You know, I just think, and again, it can be just a suggestion to take a look at what went wrong, fix it, codify it and address it. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be as broad based as possible. So I don't know what anybody else's thoughts are, but I've never seen anything like this in my life. I never anticipated seeing this in my lifetime. And again, I have a degree in government, political science, I've been involved my entire life and never did I ever imagine that I would have ever seen anything like this and experience it. And it's, it's heartbreaking. It's of concern, and um, and now we've got your daughter and my son at risk. Correct. In the next few days. Yes. You know, for all these good people, you know, you know they're, they're not good people, and yeah, they're the minority, but they are affecting our lives. And, and you know, maybe it's a little closer to home because now I have a, a, a kid who's a, who's a police officer, you know, in the major capital city of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, in the toughest area of the city. Yeah. So obviously, it comes home a little bit. You know, while I was concerned before and the price, you know, and the concern and they appreciate all that they do. Yeah, I'm a little bit more concerned now, obviously. Um, so, I don't know, we need to say something and, and I'm open to suggestions and um, we need to send a message because again, it's gotta come from the bottom up instead of the top down because if you wait for the top down to do it, good luck, unless they hear from us. They're not going to do it. They're not going to address it appropriately on a timely basis. And if they don't address it, then we address it at the at the ballot box, plain and simple. I mean, we've seen changes starting to take place already on both sides, good, bad, or indifferent, where the voters are taking control again. Thank goodness, you know. But we need to say something. <clears throat> so I'm open to suggestions. But tell me I'm crazy. Yeah. No. I. I mean, I'll just jump in. I. I'm a continuous improvement kind of guy, and you don't usually have to codify or fix things, especially norms that have been accept accepted for many, many decades, but apparently we do now. And so, you know, we've written letters before. I think we should write a letter again. We've had good responses before when we've done this sort of thing. I think it'd be appropriate to do it again. Um, so I don't see any harm in suggesting that Democracy has been challenged, has been broken, and that we should be we should be encouraging people, encouraging the government to not miss the opportunity to look back and see what broke and how they can tighten it up. Because I think I don't think anybody's very comfortable with what's been going on. Um, I I think something that's coming across is you know sort of. Some of that, something that's kind of now being chattered about as rules of decorum. I agree with you, Mr. Walner, because I think, you know, it, it already is against the law to do some of the things that were observed. It already is federal crime to see. It, it, it's already, it goes against, it's, it's abhorrent to, you know, beat someone who's securing the premises on behalf of our, you know, legislators. So, I mean, some of this isn't really, doesn't need to be codified. It already is. But I, I do think there's a, you know, I think that certainly in a bipartisan view of this, and I don't want to speak for all of my colleagues, but I, I think we're all opposed to violence and violent acts being committed no matter what. Um, I don't know what we would tell them, although I love the idea of the suggestion of a bipartisan committee, but perhaps there should be, you know, rules of decorum. People have kind of lost their manners, lost their minds and lost their manners. And that was 
fairly traumatic to, to observe and, you know, people need to dial down the emotion and bring the logic back to the forefront in, in terms of what's going on here. But I don't know that a letter is going to make that happen, but I'm not opposed to the idea, Mr. O'Leary. I think that that's, you know, maybe take a paper to pen and put your thoughts down and let's look at it and see what we can do to send it. What you're saying isn't, what you're saying is probably not just on all five of our minds, but also on the minds of everybody that's in public service right now. You know, so from, from the people that are nationally elected to us, we're all thinking about it, but it goes beyond that too, of course, everybody that's watching it, if you weren't traumatized by that, then probably you're desensitized to it at this point. So, um, and it is scary and it is traumatic to, to, to see that happening. <clears throat> They were conducting business. They were conducting, like you said, basically administrative business, and that disrupted the business in addition to costing some people their lives. So that would be I, my I thought. Agree. Um, just, just, you know. I just want to add, I, I agree totally um, on, yeah, we should at least, I mean, yeah, I mean, you don't, uh, you got to try, right? You got to at least try. So I agree with Mr. O'Leary about that and put it, you know, maybe he can put it better with the experience. I mean, I, I might put it a little too blunt for who's going to read it, for lack of a better way to put it. That's what um, he, maybe that's what we might need. Though. And then, uh, but no, decorum, I agree. Uh, Chimani Pelli, I like to call it that we have become a relaxed culture. Everything's relaxed. Everything is you know, you, you know, it, it, n there is no more formality. Formality is bad. Formality is old school format. If you're formal, you're not with the in crowd. And this is coming from, I'm 38 years old. I'm not, you know, I'm not a 70 or 80 year old saying this. And it, and it, and it does though, psychologically. And by the way, this pandemic has made it worse because Zoom culture is the epitome of no one caring about anything anymore. You know, every day it looks like somebody's at the beach when they're really supposed to be conducting business. So I do agree though, that that is now translated to, it's kind of like the formality of wait your turn, right? It's you can protest and you're allowed, but how about you make a meeting with some of these officials at the Capitol, right? Something like that, with which is, I, I feel like, you know, if you're that enraged, I, I, I've never seen a politician who's not dying to talk to a couple thousand people at the same time. So, but you just got to do it. So, yeah, I just wanted to say that I think it's, it's part of a broader culture issue it, across America. And I think it's, it's gotten all age groups because it's not just younger, it's everyone where it's the relaxed culture kind of do what makes you feel good, not always do what's the right thing to do. So that's just, you know, uh, that, that I've been holding that in for a while. And I feel like now it is, we are seeing what happens when we all stop caring about what other people think of us. So. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yeah. Oops. So, um, Mrs. Gonzalez. <laughs> Go for it. We like your input too. I'm actually re refreshed by Mr. O'Leary's statement. Um, I I'm happy to see blame not being put on one side or the other. Um, this is a this is a problem that our country has all around. Um, from from the president not speaking always so properly and, and tweeting crazy to the Speaker of the House tearing up the State of the Union. You know, from the top down, we're seeing not good behavior um, on both sides. So, you know, we had riots not long ago that, you know, went from a, a protest that were being done properly to players taking it too far and that went on for weeks and um and this time again you know a a protest like it's supposed to be and bad players taking it too far 
So what this country needs to do is come back together. So I, I like the Bart bipartisan agenda. I mean, I think that that is something that needs to be said and reminded to the people running this show that, you know what, we don't want our, we don't want to see this in our country. We don't want to see people pitted against each other and harming each other. And, you know, they need to know that this country needs to come back together, you know, and, and they need to lead that. So I think that's what they do need to be told. So what do you say, Mr. O'Leary? You want to give it a go? Put your thoughts down on paper and... Sure, I'll be happy to do that, but I can tell you right now, I'm going to have a very difficult time tempering my remarks, but I'll try. Well, then I don't <laughs> I have to do that. I did pretty well, <laughs> well tonight, so we will give it a shot. Yeah. We did very well tonight. Let's go from here. Let's be an example. Right. Let's yeah. work so, together. So I'll just say- Marlo's <laughs> chuckling over there. <laughs> you know, the challenge, you know, the challenge can go up the line, but it can also be in our town as well. I mean, we do have a Republican town committee, and we do have a Democrat town committee. I mean, maybe they should also get together and try to uh, speak from their platforms together in a bipartisan way. It doesn't have to be just up the line. It could be right in our own town and, you know, put out a challenge to our own residents to see if they want to get involved and do that as well. So, I mean, you know, mm. uh, Steve, if you need to, if you need to bounce some ideas off, I of certainly that. do. Because I would appreciate. I want to, I want to think about this a little bit more because this is yep. a good, this is a good, this is a good uh, initiative that you know we could easily miss an opportunity. Yeah, uh, I agree. We should think about it on a local level, but also on a national level. That's just my suggestion. I agree. I think there's so many things that that obviously impact us directly that are happening on the national level, and that is one example. But I also think that it's more to us, and and I'm no, I don't mean us because I do think. I mean, there's five of us, and we don't always agree, no matter what party we're from. But we always at least give each other list a listen to understand where each other is coming from. But I agree with Mr. Studo. That's kind of lost, I think, at this moment in time. I think people, I mean, if you told me someone was going to actually record themselves committing a federal crime and then posting it, I that would be, it's, to me, is never accused those people of being smart. So, <laughs> so right, but it, you know, like are not, right? it's, it's, it's a culture that lives through its phone and it's a culture that does does everything to show other people through through its phone and you know even if that means disregarding logical thought and and correct action but i know yeah, they'll I mean, they'll that's... i know it'll be easy for them to locate these people and prosecute these people but in terms of you know just that sort of you're not going to be able to force people to res respect one another's point of view but certainly we should make some sort of a statement with regard to that. <clears throat> Just there's a loss of decorum. And I think you're probably going to see across the board or communities across the board start to um, take more seriously levels of decorum with the way we treat each other on public boards and commissions. And, you know, the respect of the forum, respect of the rules and, you know, respect of the parliamentary process you, you know that's probably what we're going to see that's old-fashioned even the word parliamentary is an old-fashioned word but they, they, were, close. they were in <laughs> place because you could rely on that if someone stepped out of bounds or did something you could rely on that rule to put someone back into the bounds that they needed to go <clears throat> and that's on a smaller scale obviously than what you're talking about Mr. O'Leary but um, I'm all for it. I'm all for us not just talking about it and airing our issues of it being traumatic for us and disturbing for us, but also taking an action um, and whatever we need to do to try to, you know, push that push that forward. I'm I'm happy. I'm behind it. I'm also happy. I want to tell you too that the. I was so thrilled that the, um, because our kids are watching this, of course, and mine are, you know, and Mr. Studios are, are, mine always watch the news. Mr. Studios are probably a little bit too young, but they're watching this and they're being impacted by it. And I was so happy that 
the principal of the high school allowed the teachers extra time in their blocks to talk to the kids for as long as to talk to the students for as long as the students wanted to talk about this and work it on. I mean, they're definitely seeing civics in, you know, civics lessons daily at this point, but history too. So <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy that Mr. Lopret allowed them a little bit of extra time um, if they, if the students wanted to talk about it for a while, and it, it's my understanding they did. <clears throat> um, so I'm, I'm happy that the school gave them that chance too. So, all right. So we're gonna we're gonna move on to board member reports. So we're, we're gonna. I didn't, I didn't do old and new yet. Oh my gosh! I'm so sorry, <laughs> Mrs. <laughs> Gonzalez. I know it. Yeah. All right, Mrs. Gonzalez, old and new business. Um, because I have a couple of things, but first I just wanna um take note of uh, in the chat, Maureen Doherty, um, FYI, the Bell in the Third Meeting House um, Coppola is 161 years old this year. Oh, wow. So. They were formal back then, real formal, the dress and everything. <laughs> Maybe we'll ring it 161 times. <laughs> um, we don't want to break it. <laughs> we should make sure it's in good Yeah, we should probably be gentle with it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I also got a call from a constituent um, yesterday. There was another accident at Central and North. Um, it's, really be, it, it's a really bad <clears throat> section. And um, anyone who travels that road, which um, Mrs. Manupelli and I, I believe Mr. O'Leary probably also, you know, um, daily are at that intersection and I've had my close calls. It's a, it's a tough spot. Um, and they're requesting strongly that we take another look at it and have another discussion. I, you know, we, we have discussed it before and- Excuse me, who's, re who's requesting? I don't know if they wanted me to say. Uh, oh, you're talking residents or you're talking- A oh. resident. Oh, a resident, a resident. Okay, I thought you were talking public safety or somebody. Okay. No, 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 no. A resident called me, um, who who was a family member of who was involved in the crash. So of course they were very upset. Um, so I just thought you know we'd put it on the radar and and find some time maybe to to discuss that again, maybe come up with some kind of an idea mm -hmm. that could help. I don't know, if, Mr. Gilberto, if we could involve DPW or public say, I don't know. I mean, I think something needs to happen there before something really <laughs> awful happens. Um, and then I also wanted to throw something out there that I've already discussed with um, Mr. Gilberto before and got a kind of a, a no, a kind of a, that can't happen. <laughs> but I'm gonna, well. in, light, in light of Gloria Mastro, um, this was on the top of her honeydew list, and on my last letter from her, she made it clear that it hadn't happened yet about the town hall mailbox being moved over to the island so that it could be a drive through um, for the seniors, you know, to be able to drive through and put their mail in and, you know, the drop off box for the bills to be over, moved over there. And I know that it was a clearance issue, but I mean, even if we have to give up a parking spot, I don't know, can can we make it happen in, you know, in memory of her? Like, I don't know, maybe maybe just visit it again. Well, raise mailbox. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Mastro mail. <laughs> yeah. Um, just wanted to just put that out there too. That's all. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, would you like me to respond or? I think we want you to make it happen, but go ahead. <laughs> you can respond. <laughs> so I, 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 don't, I, I hope it didn't come across that I just said no <laughs> when it was first <laughs> asked. I, I did look at the site with the public. You're market. not usually that curt. You're usually a little more yeah. diplomatic. I, 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 but um, <laughs> I, I, did, I did look at the site. Maybe it was Chris that said no. <laughs> Uh, that's possible. <laughs> no, no I, Mr. Deming and I did look at the site, and um, it, it, within days of the last time it was brought up, we had an an, in, an issue with a an oversized tractor trailer that came in the parking lot, 
that would have um, probably destroyed anything that was in its way. And we're, we're lucky the flagpole still stand in there when it when it pulled out. So I just think we're gonna we need, we need to put our thinking caps on about a, a different strategy for where it might need to be located. There are implications for staff as well, having to go out and get it, which uh, I think that we could probably address. But um, at the short <laughs> is I think we could take another look at it and try to determine what what's feasible. Um, on the issue of um, the intersections, um, we you know, we did have some uh, requests for funding um, that were not advanced through the capital planning process uh, in fiscal year 2021, um, and for a variety of reasons, you know, and, and all I think all the right reasons, honestly. Um, I know Representative Jones has been able to secure some level of funding in the state budget for public safety improvements in North Reading, and I think you had an eye towards intersection improvements, particularly um, Haverhill and uh, Chestnut Streets, where um, we, we are uh, familiar with a number of different accidents that have occurred. Um, you know, we can. One thing that we've been discussing is whether or not it, a, a more prudent approach might be a warrant article to try to delve further into the, inter, the multiple intersections that we're dealing with, not necessarily get into you know, a huge capital appropriation at the moment, but at least figure out what's right. I think all of us on this call know that intersection is probably the most difficult because of the topography that we're talking about there. Yeah. Um, we'd love to plunk a stop sign up right there, four-way stop, yeah, yeah. move on, but we all know that the issues that, that go with that. So, you know, it, it's there it is it is complex but I, you know i'm happy to revisit that with uh, the police chief and the dpw director in light of this initial seed money that may be available from the state I mean, if I, yeah if i could just add and i'm sorry to interrupt you but um after after getting that phone call and driving it this morning um they they wanted me to notice that going um towards central on north um the only speed limit sign is well before the country club there's not another one from the country club before the country club all along that route there are on the other side um going towards 28 but going towards central and that is the issue is coming down that hill so quickly when you're already ha coming out of central all of a sudden this car will appear you know flying down that hill so um even just something as small as that is more more speed and maybe reducing this the speed you know at some point maybe at the nursing home to another point you know in that area it could be as simple as that so just maybe another conversation about it sure something i can follow up with i'm happy to do so yeah, I, I will say to to th this just happened to me actually. When you when you are leaving Central, crossing over North, you can't actually see what's coming left. So this this literally just happened to me where I was clear on the left, I, and you can definitely see down below on North. I was clear on the right, so I was gonna go across. And I was heading right into a pedestrian in the crosswalk right in front of me, just because I was anxious to move along, move forward to because I didn't, because I know you yeah. might be clear for a second, but then a car is barreling down that hill. And and I mean, thank luckily I saw the man and I was at a full stop. So it wasn't like I was going from zero to 80 in, in a second, but you know, <clears throat> you're more con I think you're more with so concerned with what's coming at us on the left and if we're clear go you know so that that luckily didn't lead to anything bad but it's it's the same thing when cars are coming down that hill they can't see what's you can actually see what's coming from central street so it's really dangerous you know mm -hmm. but um um, and then as far as that mailbox thing, back to that mailbox, just quickly, my thought would be instead of just for one track trail that never should have tried to go in that roundabout anyway, you know, maybe you just put a no track to trail aside, <laughs> put the mailbox up and put no oversized trucks or track to trailers, you know, because they can go back in the back parking lot and make that easily. They can clear that easily. I don't know how many times you have tractor trailers coming in and out of that roundabout, but I don't know. I mean, it's not really meant for big, <clears throat> big trucks like that, you know. It certainly is not. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
<laughs> Maybe you should be putting that up anyway to avoid any more damage, you know? But anyway, all right. So anything else, Mrs. Gonzalez? No, thank you. All right. Now let's get to board member reports because, uh, you know, we probably have a new board member reports. Mr. O'Leary, anything? I'm, I'm also, you're pretty much up to date with the Board of Health and I'm meeting it again until next week. Um, and still waiting for guidance from the from the state as to how we're going to um, assist yeah. with the uh, dispensing of the vaccine and uh, a lot of logistics going into even the, the dispensing for this week for our first responders. So, you know, they're working hard, they're paying attention, they're trying to get some answers to, to questions that, uh, that aren't being answered yet. And um, my guess is we're going to be faced with a, a whole lot of information on a short window of opportunity and being told to do things that you're kidding me, right? So anyway, it, it, it's still a state of confusion from the federal to the state level right now. And uh, we're just trying to prepare ourselves. Okay. Other than that, well said, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Strudo, anything? Yes, um, actually EDCP, I have all kinds of updates. Two points, one to the traffic, central to 62 is not a piece of cake either. And I can tell you that because my wife called and let's just say today there's somebody watching over someone in a much smaller car than my wife's because they would have ended up all the way to Park Street. Um, people blast through there because they missed time. I remember that the state trooper who gave me my test said that if you have to think about it, you're already too late, right? When making a turn onto, and that's how I always say, if I even have to think about it, I'm too late. I got to wait for the car to leave. So yeah. once again, it seems like the reoccurring theme that Central seems to be a nightmare all the way from yeah. where it first connects to Chestnut all the way. So it's just like, maybe we just get rid of Central and make it a big walkway. Anyways, <laughs> and, and, and then secondly, just to- well, we uh, Just one giant sidewalk. We do need a sidewalk on Central Street. We do. Just and then uh, <laughs> just to make one point before this, because I just wanted, I didn't want to interrupt uh, when about the, the tax. So property, I, I know it's things when the tax bill goes up. However, there is a there is some a caveats that if you plan on selling, you're gonna get a lot more money than you did even five years ago because the average North Reading home, according to Zillow, is up 23%. And so supposedly the forecast is 10% for next year. So that's pretty good, especially if you've been in the house for 30 years, assuming you have no mortgage, you're really accumulating some wealth there. And number two, if you don't plan on selling, well, somebody in your family is going to get a pretty nice gift or a charity. So I'm just trying to say that there are some silver linings to the tax today. It's not like you're, if you're getting a bigger tax bill, like Mr. O'Leary said, it's not because the town is trying to do more. It's because we, we can't ignore property values going up 10% in one year. I mean, you just can't do that. It's just economically impossible. So, yeah, but we do just to just a point. We, we do have a lot of people who've been in town for more than 30 years, you know, 40 years, 50 years, so that, you know, they're retired. Uh, they're on social security or small pensions if they're lucky and, and all of a sudden now you know their three bedroom ranch you know that they paid 12 or twenty four thousand dollars for 45 50 years ago is now being assessed and their taxes are nine thousand dollars a year you know so it's a hardship like i said you know we, we have a lot of tax clients mm -hmm. you know, tax season's coming upon us you know hundreds and hundreds of them and there are people who are strapped in other words they're land rich and cash poor they don't want to go anywhere else but they're finding it difficult to stay and, and again we've had these discussions you know is there anything more we can do for people whether we can abate it or we can, <laughs> we can postpone it and, and those sorts of things and, and we have to get a little and, more creative with it and uh, and i agree mr O'Leary. Really, I, really I, I wasn't trying to reopen the discussion yeah. i just said it's yeah. more of you know and this is something that maybe one of the, the committees i'm on can think of but again it's something where if the economic trends keep continuing like this with real estate there is very little we can do, unfortunately. I mean, I'm just I'm just stating the the obvious truth, not trying to sugarcoat it, that we have to sometimes look at the silver lining when there's a bigger force than nothing in, no one in this town can stop, which is real estate prices. So just, that's all I was trying to say. Um, so I unfortunately could not make the EDC. However, I spoke to multiple people that did and got a nice, I want to thank uh, Mrs. McKnight uh, because she's made it, uh, very easy for me to when sometimes I can't do back to back to just keep me informed. So I really do appreciate uh, what she's doing. I know that she's got small children as well. 
Um, so as part of the EDC meeting, a couple of things came up. Um, no, um, the officer positions were not chosen yet, uh, but some progress is being made to the final joint appointment, uh, you know, to the EDC openings. Um, also, uh, Lisa Egan from the chamber gave uh, kind of joined in for a conversation and it seems like, you know, just spitballing around, how can we help small businesses? You know, can we feature them? Can we, um, you, know, you know, pretty much in a nutshell, what everybody's thinking, what can we do during this really trying need where every time you feel like you have a solution, there's another restriction that happens because it just has to happen for health purposes. You know, you're like a light bulb goes up and then you find out that your light bulb sounds good, but it may do X, Y, and Z. So some really good ideas came out of that. And uh, there's gonna be some more uh, local outreach. Um, I do think that uh, one of the biggest things we can do is keep hammering home the shop local. I know I discovered a couple of places that didn't exist in North, that I didn't know existed in North Reading that I bought a few things and I was like, you know, I also got my instant gratification of getting it the second I wanted it rather than waiting even two days with Amazon. So remember that instant gratification is good for the local uh, community. Um, so uh, also then there was a presentation made about sewer. Um, we here, especially me and Mr. O'Leary are pretty, have seen that probably about a hundred times by now, but then the board has seen it and there was a general discussion about it. Um, you know, I, I know there's still some concern about viability. Uh, however, uh, it does seem that you know, more information is coming out uh, and on how it can benefit multiple projects. And there was just a, a discussion with the EDC about that and how to link in maybe some other parts of town uh, about it. And then also some new loan programs are coming out to help small businesses. One of the major differences about this one is that the income requirement may is not going to be as strict because I think that really pushed out a lot of our more successful small businesses that just were having a hard time right now because you can't undo what you did in 2019. So sometimes that tax return alone would make you not qualify for some of these other loan or grant programs. So I think uh, it seems that that one has been uh, made a little bit easier. So I could uh, just um, jump in there. Yeah, please do. Second, um, that deadline is the 15th. So if somebody wanted to jump on that, I, I believe it's, it's yeah, I, it's coming up. Yeah, it's the 15th, I believe. I agree. Is yep. There a link? Is there a link on the um town? On the homepage, yes. There Correct, is. yes. Yeah. So they'd want to get on that right away. <clears throat> okay. And then uh for CPC, a couple things. There's a working group. There's four concepts that um are in the works for Carpenter Drive. There's a working group. Um, I, as liaison, am representing the select board on this group uh, with uh, uh, Danielle McKnight, Dan Mills, uh, Mr. Pierce, and um, Ms. Preeny. So uh, I think we're uh, meeting on that. We're trying to nail it down just to have our initial, uh, just like a Zoom call to talk about everything for this, um, uh, for tomorrow. We're trying, or Wednesday. Uh, cause I think one thing that came up in the CPC is that again, for something important of a project like that, it's good to get all the players involved and then come to the select board and make sure that everybody has agreement before we go to the town to try to get an approval. So I think that's why these calls are going to be really fruitful rather than just everyone going to their respective board or committee and talking about it and then finding out later that no one's on the same page on the, on the four different concepts. So, uh, also, North Street, uh, Benevento's putting a commercial space. Really, the biggest thing I got out of there is that we might get more sidewalk out of it, paid for by uh, Benevento, which would be nice there on North Street, which I think has some of the same problems as our uh, future walkway Central Street yeah. in uh, North Reading, where we could use it. Um, some minor issues they have to update as well. Uh, Main Street, where Dos Lobos is, again, not to get too specific, but just because there was a bigger conversation, they're changing it to a brewery, and there's just some design and, uh, you know, spec issues that need to come back for CPC review. Uh, Mr. Walner hit already that, you know, there was a discussion that the facilities master plan uh, be 
well, that meeting happened and just to get that going again. So I'm not going to really spend too much time. And then there was just a small discussion while we were waiting, same like here, we were waiting for a, a hearing to start for, I think, the Main Street that, um, you know, sewer is something that has gained a lot of traction. And we do feel, I think at this point, that it may be in the October town meeting. So there was a general discussion of, is it, um, you know, just about revenue, who's going to pay for it, how it's going to be paid. And it just seems that, uh, you know, the more information, the better about that. But, you know, that's. Um, that is that is it and then I have oh one last thing there and, and again I know Mr. Wallen was there so if I misspeak here please correct me because I wrote down some notes but there is actually a grant from the ADA for 35000 that was just given to Danielle McKnight to study I believe how to make things more accessible around North Reading, um, you know, for, I'm assuming ramps and other things that would make it more accessible. I did, I have noticed around town here and there that there still are some, uh, let's call them legacy properties that are, uh, it'd be hard if you can't walk upstairs. So I think that's a really nice thing that even though it did give Miss McKnight another project, which I feel like she's taken up so many, uh, this is something nice because, you know, it's, uh, it's really unfortunate when you see that whether you're driving by or walking by or know someone personally that can't do a very what we take for granted that's the best way to put it activity like walking up a set of stairs and has to just find a very creative way to get into a building that wasn't made for them to get into so I do think that's a nice thing so that's another uh, honeydew list for Gloria is the automatic door at the town hall <laughs> oh. But that's, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's all I have. I tried to talk as fast as possible, even though the caffeine ran out about seven hours ago. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Studo. Mr. Waller, board member reports? Yeah, so um, as you may recall, I'm sure you do, the George Floyd incident set off a, um, a, uh, a, um, a flurry of activity in North Reading back in like May, I think it was when it happened. And it was like a Friday night and a lot of people showed up at the gazebo on the common there. And, uh, you know, a few of us were there in attendance. And then it became really obvious to me that, you know, this is good energy, but if you don't direct it in the right way, it's going to not really go very far. So um, I did do two summits during the summer and attracted in each, each session uh, a number of people from town, from various, you know, town employees as well as residents. And, I, and then I kind of let them go and do their own thing. Well, as it turned out, they have assembled and they have uh, created a group called the North Reading Human Rights Commission. It's uh, comprised of about nine uh, different people in town, including some high school people, including uh, some university people, including uh, the police representatives, um, including some town employees, including some local residents who just care. And uh, they're gonna be announcing themselves, which is appropriate um, this weekend. I think on Thursday, I think uh, the transcript will be issuing a press release. And in honor of uh, Martin Luther's King Day, they're going to be doing a book club, um, a meeting on March 4th, uh, featuring the book Stamped, which was written by Jason Reynolds. And it's a New York Times bestseller. And it's a really good introduction to racial issues and why maybe a community may wanna get involved. And they have a, they're planning another event of a documentary coming up after that. But um, uh, you know, um, it, it's a great effort that they're doing, and it's um, you know, for our town is you know we're really white. I mean, we're you know we're ninety eight percent white, um, and it, it's probably hard for some residents to understand why maybe this is important. But I I would encourage you if you feel like being in a non threatening, non judgmental area, this would be a really good way to. Uh, work with people who really are just trying to do it through an educational point of view. And, you know, there's no browbeating, there's no political agenda. It's just, let's just talk about the topics. Um, but then also, if that doesn't compel you, the other the thing I'd point out is that our kids are growing up in a world that is much more diverse and 
and full of color than what we grew up with and what we have in this town. And so if you're not compelled for your own reasons, just out of curiosity, think about your kids because your kids are growing up in a world that is a lot different than what we experienced and will continue to trend that way. And so, you know, it's, it's a really, it's, it, we owe it to a, you know, us as a community to get involved and learn about it one way or another. And, you know, starting with this book would be a good way to get started. So sometimes it's like board gets things going and sometimes it has an impact. Um, and I think that's all I have. Thank Mr. You. Walner, can you circulate contact information for that group? To oh, yeah, yeah, no, they gave me, oh, thanks for saying that. It's, um, they're gonna have any, and again, it's gonna be in the transcript and I think it's gonna be on social media a little bit as well, but there is an email for that, HRC at gmail.com. So HRC for the Human Rights Commission. And again, really good people who are trying to do the right thing for the town and, you know, have it be a long-term uh, um, effort, initiative um, to educate people. And it's really the, the way we always solve this problem is through discussion, ed education, and a non-threatening environment where we can learn. So thank you for asking. Thank you, Mr. Walner. Mrs. Gonzalez, board member reports? No, I'm good. I'm all set. All right, I'm just going to just do a few brief things. Um, first of all, for the school department, the, um, the school is having a virtual forum um, tomorrow uh, from 7 to 7.30 on maintaining a safe environment at the high school. If you have school age high schoolers, they sent around uh, a, just a quick survey to help them to have directive responses. And I think it's all about safety during uh, COVID. And, you know, you can, it's a very brief survey. It only takes about 30 seconds to complete it so that they can tailor, really tailor the, the, um, the virtual forum to what people's concerns are, what parents' concerns are in keeping, in keeping their kids safe and safety protocols that they have in place. So, um, there's a link that was sent around and some access information that was sent around. Um, and if you don't have that, you can probably just call the website uh, and I mean, um, go to the North Reading High School website. Um, and the next thing I just want to do briefly that um, Mr. Gilberto will put on the website is Senator Senator Tarr's office has um, sent out information on the health connector. So for people in the community who've lost their jobs and may have lost their um, job-based health insurance, there's a forum on Wednesday, January 13th that the health connector is hosting. Um, it's a live webinar. So um, that's from four to 5 p.m. and it will explain to you what you can do, giving you information about the, the state's health connector program and insurance benefits that might be available to you and in other information about COBRA and other tips. And Mr. Gilberto, that'll be on the website, right? It's on the home page now, yep. Okay, great. Um, so the, so the, High school forum is tomorrow evening. That forum that that is on the Mass Health Connector is on the on Wednesday, four to five. And then the other thing I just wanted to say is if you haven't checked out the Flint Memorial Library, you probably should. They offer these tech programs for people. You can sign up to get tech advice. And they have um, people helping you walk through, you know, if you've got new tech equipment or computer or things like that, you can sign up for, um, you can sign up for some one-on-one -on -one tech help. And they also have multiple, they've been also have been publicizing multiple events with authors where they're doing virtual meetings with authors on certain books or topics. So go to Flint Memorial library.org and look those things up because I think they're, Despite everything going on, they're continuing to run some great programming and great services for the community as usual. So, and that's. Well, you think they can help us? I got so a Fitbit for Christmas. And we're still trying to figure this stupid thing out. And, yeah. it, it, and I call it stupid, and we're the stupid ones. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You'll love that. Yes. Yeah. Any, oh. any gadget, anything like that, they can help you walk through. But once yeah. you figure that out, you're going to love it. 
<laughs> but Steve, you got to walk to make it. Oh, maybe that's the <laughs> You have to wear it. That's not yeah, registered. You have, yeah. have to charge it and wear it. You can't not sit in your couch you know, waiting for yeah. it to do its thing if you're sitting on the couch. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. There's yeah. a commercial that she puts it on her dog. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I like that commercial. <laughs> oh, that's great. All right. And with that, do we have a motion to adjourn? Yes. And a motion to adjourn. Mr. Studo, motion to adjourn. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And you, Pelly, is aye. <laughs> A quick meeting once again, ending at 11 16. <laughs>